because there's a lot of pent up anger over the last year. All right, we can do this. Solar Warden, how you doing, bud? Downshift, Knucker, Justin Maynard, good to see you all. Thank you for coming on in. And uh, who else do we have here? Solar Warden, good to see you. And where else? Where else? Where else? Ian McFadden, nice to have you here. And uh, let's see here as we're trying to catch up. And where are we here? DJ Duvernois, how you doing? Good to see you. All right, here we go. Dirty Filth, nice to have you back. And Goofita, what's happening, man? Good to see you. Eric Enright, welcome to our chat room. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Mazo, how you doing? Welcome to our chat room. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you don't mind. And uh, Acreon Caburn, what's happening, Acreon? Good to have you back. Thank you so much. All right, good way to support this show, everyone, is through the Super Chat. It is up and running. Thank you, Smithy, for kicking it off. We appreciate it. Hi, Sensational Sherry. Oob to Joe's Maine. You've got Swamp Dwelling. Yes, you do. Mama Susan, good to see you. We're going to get going here in about 10 seconds. Don't forget, if you're new, hit that subscribe button, ring the bell. We are here seven days a week for your listening entertainment. But right now, let's get our horns up. It's time to rock with Bumblefoot. of Central British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show and our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help break the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. We have one of the most popular creepy pasta influencers here on the show tonight making his third appearance swamp dweller is back now if you haven't hit subscribe on his channel i highly suggest you do he's got almost a quarter million followers who tune in and watch his videos on the creepiest spookiest stories that you will find anywhere on the internet are they real are they fake are they encounters that real people like you and me are encountering only the person telling the story knows But what we do know is that it is one heck of an interesting and entertaining channel. And tonight, Swamp Dweller is going to get into the Christmas spirit and Thanksgiving spirit as we enter the holiday season. We are going to get into some Christmas creepypasta for you tonight. Mr. Swamp Dweller, it is always a pleasure to have you on Spaced Out Radio, my friend. How you been doing? Not too bad, Dave. Thanks for having me on, brother. It's good to be back. It is always good. And I want to say a big thank you because at least once to three times a week, you pop into our chat room at night and you hang out with our audience and our audience absolutely loves it and loves you. We've tried to turn as many people onto your channel as possible as well. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much for your nightly support for what we do here on this show. Yeah, anytime. It's always great to come and listen and hear what your guests got to say. And uh, I like the little uh, chats you have at the end of the streams and such. It's always nice to hear uh, some of your thoughts and opinions and such. Well, I very rarely get a a chance to do that. But, you know, thank you. And sometimes I don't know if my opinion means anything. But you know what? Got to put it out there. That's our job as a public. But this is about you tonight, my friend, because you are somebody who has a very strong following you know, a cult following, I will say that. And I'm proud to be a part of that cult following. I really am, you know, because you entertain me every single night, you know, and for people who don't know, literally, when I get off the air, like I have a studio in my house that I broadcast all around the world from. And literally, I I go upstairs, 
I get the dogs all settled in, make sure that they're ready for bed, and then I crawl into bed, throw my headphones in, and boom, it's straight to Swamp Dweller's channel. Because your, t your entertainment, man, I, I am so appreciative that I found it because you tell the you know the stories that are really freaking people out and i don't know if you're doing that on purpose or you're just going by the stories that are given to you but i'll tell you man whatever you're doing it is successful well first of all thank you for all the support dave that's really appreciated and uh i'm I, I'm kind of uh, blown away by the support that we've gotten from Spaced Out and all that. Um, you guys are amazing. And uh, I'm in the same boat as you, man. Um, the stories are just absolutely phenomenal, and it's mainly just because we have such an awesome group of people who support and dwell in the swamp with us, and uh, they send in their allegedly true experiences, as you said in the intro. You know, are they true? Are they, are they false? You know, are these real encounters? And uh, at the end of the day, all I can say is, you know, they're allegedly true. So they're, you know, the people sending in them say they experienced these things and who am I to say they didn't, right? But uh, ultimately, I think that's kind of the fun and the uh, the entertainment aspect of everything is, you know, which ones are real, which ones aren't. And uh, if even a fraction of these are real, this is one strange planet we live on. What amazes me is a lot of people will look at you and they'll say, is he making up these stories on our own? But you actually are, are filled with emails daily coming in of people who are claiming to have these encounters. And, you know, you can only take the emails and the people at their word. But, I mean, do you ever feel that, that you know, if, if half of these creatures or 10% of these creatures are true and real encounters that, man, there's some scary stuff out there? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um I would say that a good percentage of these stories can be researched and kind of vetted in a sense, um, especially when it comes to like locations. If they mention weapons or such like that, I can kind of look into these things. I can kind of see uh, if I, I can kind of do a little bit of verification behind it. And um, I would definitely say if even 10 percent of these creatures that people are allegedly seeing are real, then uh, there's a lot of things that could also possibly be real as well. I mean, like, let's say if Bigfoot, for example, exists, who's to say that aliens aren't on, you know, aren't already visiting Earth, right? It's not that much of a jump, in my opinion. So, you know, if one thing exists, the other has to. For you, out of all the creatures that you've heard, is, is there any, any any stories that you have heard of any of these creat uh, creatures out there that have really put the goosebumps on your back? Oh, yeah. Um, several. Um, especially stories that are similar to things that I, I have seen in myself or experienced myself. Um, ones that will give me, for some reason recently, ones that have been giving me the most goosebumps are these weird not deer stories. You know, uh, whether it's deer with chronic wasting disease or some actual weird species of deer that stand up on a, their hind legs and look, you know, dead. Um, it just gives me such goosebumps because there's so many times where I'll be walking early in the morning with my dog or something and I see a deer kind of pop out of the tree line and I'm like, oh shit, here's my not deer story. Like, <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, man. I, I totally get exactly where you're coming from because thanks to you, every time I have deer in my yard, which is literally daily, I'm looking for something standing on two legs now that looks half dead. It, it's your fault. It is completely <laughs> your fault, and, and I, I'm more than willing to put that blame on you. For people who may not know, what is a knot deer? Um, a knot deer is commonly something that people would call a skimwalker, but like skimwalker is kind of a term that's been more bastardized and kind of turned into like the general term for boogeyman these days, you know? So like to, to a little bit more specifically, there are a few varieties of these not deer type creatures or deer type creatures in general. You have tall deer and not deer, and they're basically the same thing depending on what tribe or native indigenous people you are talking to. But essentially, a not deer or a tall deer is a deer like creature that is that stands on two feet. Um, often looks very emaciated, uh, looks unnatural, looks very distorted, moves and acts weird. Uh, often will run on its hind legs at you, will have these absolute demonic screeches, these these growls, these howls that are just, you know, a mix of, you know, anything you would find uh, to fuel your nightmares pretty much. And um, they're said to be spirits in some cultures. Uh, some say they're forest protectors and others say they're demons. 
And then uh, some people just think they're skinwalkers. So it's uh, definitely an interesting phenomenon. For you, as you've gone down this road, has it increased your encounters? Because a lot of times, a lot of people believe, especially in the spiritual world, that the more you talk about these topics, the more chance you're going to have strange things happen to you. Um, I get asked this all the time, and I don't think so. I think it goes hand in hand with another question where people say, does this make you paranoid? And um, not really, because, I mean, I've had some weird encounters and uh, when I first started doing this, I would say maybe some weird stuff picked up a little bit. But in all honesty, I, I don't really think I've had like a scary story outside of just, you know, encounters with people and, you know, stuff like that um, really happened to me. I have not like, you know, had a, a skimwalker encounter or a not deer encounter myself. But uh, like I said earlier, every time I see a deer now, I'm like always sussed out about it. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. I, I would be too. I mean, you know, is there any story out there that you have or topic that you have covered that you're like, damn, I really do not want this happening to me, whether it's aliens or or weird creatures coming up to you in the middle of the forest or or you always have these not deer stories or or these weird white creature stories that that are sneaking up in people's backyards when they go outside, you know, for a cigarette or to take the dogs out. I mean, this scares me, man. Yeah, there's been an uptick in those stories, those skinny white creature stories, and there's been like all kinds of variations of them too. So I'm not entirely sure what the heck that is, but um, I mean, there's I, there's all kinds of stuff. Like it could be the these road trip stories that I've been recently doing, where you know you got people trying to break into your car and stuff. Uh, there was a time where I was homeless and I lived in my car, and I had that happen to me. Somebody tried to you know break into my car when I was sleeping in it. So like stuff like that, you know, I'm just like, oh man, I'd never want to go through that uh, again. And then you have these stories, like you mentioned, with these creepy, emaciated white creatures and these these not deer in just anything that I feel like would be imminent threat, especially like a monster, because I feel like that'd be like the worst death is being eaten alive by a monster or a bear or anything like that. You know, just something that would just like basically literally just start devouring you while you're still alive. Uh, like these uh, skimwalkers and not deer and Wendigo are said to do. Uh, those, these are all things I would definitely never like to meet. No, definitely not. Swamp Dweller from YouTube is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. You know, we always take a look at these stories. And once again, you always, before every episode, you, you, you tell your audience, you don't know whether this is true or not. You're just embracing the story and embracing the information that has been provided to you by listeners. Have you ever had emails come across that are just so outlandish that you're like, yeah, this one's not getting on the air? Yeah, the the quality control process has a few steps and stages. You know, I've got to, you know, obviously go uh, mainly. I, I like collect a bunch of things on a certain topic through keywords and stuff, and then I'll go through them all and you know see what's worth sharing and what's not. But there's definitely some absolutely insane stories that uh that'll get sent my way and are trying to be passed off as like a hundred percent legitimate. And you know, you'll get a few sentences in, and you're just like, oh man, this this is going to be one of those. Uh, like Lord of the Ring type stories is like what I like to call them. Well, I, I should say, and we should say uh, very quickly here, you got a new video coming out, I believe on Thanksgiving where you actually allowed me to submit one of my creepy stories that I've experienced to you. And I, I, I hope I did okay for you and not trying to, you know, get, get a pat on the back here or anything, but you know, I, I gotta be honest, man, I was a little nervous in sending that to you. I, I had to take about three or four cuts on that. Now you did great, Dave. You sounded like a natural. I think people are going to enjoy it. I do believe this video will be out on Thanksgiving, I think. I'm not sure. Maybe Thanksgiving. I, I think so. The 26th, is that Thanksgiving? The day after Thanksgiving? Um, one, one of those days. But um, yeah, it's going to be coming out next. Uh, Dave did a great job. I'm excited for that episode. It's, it's a topic I've never done. So hopefully people will enjoy it. Yeah, I'll tell you that. I'm, I'm not going to give it away. My my audience will know the story, but they could be surprised when they tune on in to you. But for your audience, I'll tell you, I've experienced a lot, man. And that one scared me. That one is one of the ones that has completely, completely scared me, man. 
So I wanted to give you a good one right off the bat, and people will have to uh, tune in to Swamp Dweller either uh, Thanksgiving in America or Black Friday, one of the two, in order to check it on out, man. But I appreciate you giving us the opportunity or me the opportunity to do that, though, dude. Yeah, definitely. We'll definitely have to have you on some future episodes as well. Do you get a lot of contributors? Um, Here and there. I like to uh, collaborate and help out some smaller narration channels and newer ones, help out uncupping voices that I like and... Sometimes I'll work with some old old friends of mine, like Let's Read and uh, Darkness Prevails and stuff like that every so often. But for the most part, it's kind of just me, you know, chipping away and knocking out these stories. Now, what a lot of people may not know is this whole Swamp Dweller phenomena that you've created here. This has become a full-time job for you. This is something that I'm sure you didn't expect to take off. Yeah, I never thought that it would do what it did. Um, the media company that I started outside of Swamp Dweller that eventually kind of consumed Swamp Dweller as a part of it, it uh, has become something so much different than I ever thought it would be. And uh, with Swamp Dweller obviously being the star of all, everything I do, it's just uh, it's afforded me a lot of other opportunities to get into the podcast world and you know be able to be on cool shows like spaced out radio and such like that on the, on, on the radio and such. So it's, uh, been a dream come true. That's for sure. But it's definitely not something that's easy. It's not something that, uh, um, I take lightly or take for granted. You know, this is a 24 seven job every single day. Um, I don't really get too much breaks and, uh, anytime I do get a break, <laughs> it's, uh, still mainly like doing back end work, like emails and sponsorship stuff and all that kind of thing. Does it ever stop? Like, how do you get time to slow down? Um, normally, what I would have to do is I would have to plan it out a couple of months in advance. And normally, I'm usually like two weeks ahead on content anyway. So I would have to just get an extra two weeks ahead on content and maybe be able to take a week off or something. Oh, but my goodness. Since my job is never ending, especially with the show growing and the uh, company growing and um, me hiring people and, you know, the, the business growing and, and just all aspects, it's just not a real time for me to be able to stop. But, you know, I do find, you know, time in the day, obviously to be able to relax and, you know, just, uh, release all the stress and everything. Did you ever see yourself as a YouTube influencer? Like we all, you know, kind of grew up with YouTube, even though I'm much older than you, we all kind of grew up with it over the last 15 plus years here. But did you ever see yourself that, you know, that this was going to be, you know, your career? This was going to be how you made your mark on this world? I knew there was there was definitely a certain tie like a couple of years ago, maybe about 12 years ago, where I saw like all these YouTubers and I was kind of going through like a depressive rut, not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, I was watching all these like vloggers at the time and I was just like, this is really sick. I wish I could do that. So I, I guess there were, I could say that I knew I wanted to do this. I just didn't know how to do it and if it would ever happen. And uh, I guess, you know, obviously fate made it happen. I'll tell you though. I mean, hard work pays off. It really does. And, uh, and I'm a firm believer in that. And the fact that you have been able to create a, a phenomenal career in something that, that you love doing, uh, I, I think it's it's wonderful. And, and you probably have a lot of people coming up to you on a daily basis, weekly basis, basically say, man, how have you been able to do it? I'm, I'm struggling, you know, and I've only got like 300 and some followers and I just can't make that mark. How, how have you been able to per, almost perfect the system for you? It's just trial and error, honestly, and just, you know, consistency and just never giving up. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say I perfected the system. Um, it changes all the time. So, you know, you, it's just a constant learning game. I'm just a, a very adaptive person, and um, I'm willing to do what I have to do to, you know, meet en make ends meet at the end of the day, you know. So, um, but it's also down to loving what you do, having passion for it, and really just enjoying storytelling. This is... It's a very monotonous job sometimes, but it, it's a very rewarding job if you enjoy what you do. You know, I think that's for any job. You know, if you don't like your job, you don't like what you're doing, you don't like your hobby, 
you're not going to be able to stick with it and do it consistently. So the biggest thing is just enjoying what you do. You know, I feel like that's a mistake a lot of people make. They just want to make content that they think people are going to care about. I got to ask you, what did your family and friends say when you're like, yeah, I, I'm making a career on YouTube and I, I, I have this weird channel about monsters. I mean, did, did they shake their head and just say, how can you make a living off of that? Yeah, my family really didn't understand what YouTube was. Um, I come from like a very rural background. We didn't even have internet until I was like 15. Uh, we were very behind the curve and... My family still is on a lot of things, but um, they they thought something way different <laughs> when I first started YouTube. They thought I, I was doing something way way crazy, and I was like, "No, guys!" It's just, eventually they understood as they saw like when like you know I was able to support myself and stuff like that, and like the business was growing, and like all these other cool opportunities were coming in, and they're like, "Oh, okay, I see. It's like a a media type thing, a radio type thing." They they kind of clicked it together through what they knew. But uh, now my dad is like a huge YouTube fan. He watches YouTube, you know, all kinds of YouTubers. Uh, he, he's like my biggest supporter. Like my son's a famous YouTuber. And I'm like, it's not that serious, dad. But like, thank you. But uh, like, we can't go anywhere with my dad anymore because he's just trying to tell every waitress and everything. I'm just like, I'm just trying to have some waffles, dad, and not be uh, bombarded. But uh, uh yeah, they didn't. But, but they didn't understand that. That's a dad's job, first, but... man. That's a dad's job. He's proud of you. He wants to brag. Oh yeah. You know, I think we all want to brag about our children, and that's a good thing, man. That's a good thing. I don't, you know, I'm just, you know, thinking about that out loud, though. But for you, I mean, you know, how, how proud are you? I, I know this, this is going to sound like a cheesy question, but how proud are you at what you've been able to accomplish with this? You know, I mean, you, I know you work 24-7 on this, and you get very little sleep because everything revolves around you doing everything. You, you, I know you have a crew, and we've talked about this in the past, but mainly you're the decision maker. You're the editor. You're, you're pretty much everything that kind of goes into it. You know, but for you, I mean, how proud are you of yourself for what you've been able to accomplish over the last few years? Um, I'm, I guess I'd say I'm pretty proud. You know, I don't really think about that too often, I guess. I'm very, um, I'm very like a forward thinking person, like what's next, what's next. So I, I don't often like sit back and look, but every so often I'll look over at the wall and, you know, you see the, the YouTube plaque and all that and, uh, and just uh, kind of put into perspective sometimes like how far things have come and, um, I'm very proud of it. I never thought that I would be in this place. You know, just a couple of years ago, I was working two full-time warehouse jobs, working like 12 hours a day minimum, you know, like breaking my back. And, uh, you know, now I'm being able to do something that I always wanted to do. You know, when I was a little kid, listening to the FM and AM radio was something that I honestly loved. I wanted to be a radio host my entire life. That was like my, always my biggest goal. And uh, to to be even on like spaced out radio, you know, like that's that's a dream come true to me. You know, it's a uh, you know being on any type of radio or what stream or podcast. It's just uh, it's all the same to me. I just always loved that kind of stuff. So I'm very proud of it and very you know grateful and uh, humbled to be able to remotely do this. All right, I know I asked you how you started, but how did you pick the topic? You know, as so we got about a minute to go here, how did you come up with creepy pasta? Was it something you heard in the past? Um, well, I didn't really start with creepypasta. That was something I kind of incorporated later. I mean, technically, most of what I do is under like the, I guess, the true scary story umbrella. But like, I just really enjoyed stories and uh, had all these stories sent to me by uh, people on my, who didn't want to come on the podcast as a guest. But and I was like, well, how do I use this content? And it kind of just fit into the format that I saw like my friend King Spook doing and uh, Darkness Prevails and such. So I was like, I can try to format my interests into that type of content. And, you know, it was something nobody at the time, nobody else was doing. So it really popularized certain topics like Dogman and Skinwalkers and such like that. It really uh, just worked out, I guess, because nobody else at the time was doing those things. Well, my friend, Swamp Dweller, we're going to get into some stories and some of your favorite stories over the next two hours here on Spaced Out Radio. Hard to believe we're already 30 minutes in to tonight's episode. Swamp Dweller from YouTube. He is a creepypasta influencer. And I'll tell you, if you like to get weirded out, if you want to hear some strange stories, if you want to hear true crime, if you want to hear about monsters, there's only one place to go that's worth it, and that is... 
Swamp Dwellers channel on YouTube. Type it on in. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Ring that bell for him because his content is amazing. I listen every day. Space Out Radio continues with Swamp Dweller right after this. All right, we're clear. Awesome. My my asshole friend, uh, Timber Hunter here, is bugging me because uh, on Saturday, like, we don't have a Taco Bell in town here, okay? Like, we're, I mean, you talk about your family being behind the times, man. I think people are still rubbing sticks together in certain areas here in order to get an internet signal, right? So we had to go out of town, and uh, Mark and I uh, decided to go r- running around. And I uh, had to drive like four and a half hours to my sister's house and four and a half hours back. We get back into 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 the city, a place called Kamloops, BC, and they got a Taco Bell. We're stopping at Taco Bell. So I'm sitting there eating my tacos, okay? I'm feeling pretty happy, a couple of beef burritos, you know, feeling like a, a, a man in charge. And then the jerk says... You know, you're going to want some for tomorrow. You should probably go get another one. And I'm like, no, man, I already broke my diet for this. He goes, are you sure? You're probably going to want more. You're probably going to not, uh, you're probably going to be really jealous if you didn't get one for tomorrow. I ended up buying another burrito for the next day. He's a bad influence, people. Stay the hell, oh, man. stay the hell away from him. He's a bad influence. I feel bad for you Canadians. It seems like you guys don't have like any authentic taquerias up there, and it just hurts my heart. Vancouver hurts my does. Heart. Vancouver does, but they're hard to find up here. Pretty far from the border, you know. I know. <laughs> and it's funny because where I used to live, which was literally about ten miles. Mo- about eight miles from the border, you could go to uh, just across the border into Sumas, Washington, and they had an awesome, authentic Mexican restaurant there. And man, that was a good feast. Good feast. But nothing like that up here. No, unfortunately. Now, my daytime boss, his wife is from Mexico, and she does like all traditional cooking. And. Mm. Mm. And he like rubs it in. I mean, well, well, what did you have for dinner tonight, boss? And and he'll just be like rattling off this beautiful Mexican dish, and I <laughs> I, I literally get up and I walk away. I feel that I have to cook you up some authentic tacos. We we do them all the time here. Uh, but there's so many good taquerias here. I'm just uh, I'm just spoiled, man. Then I go over to California once or twice a year to go visit my girlfriend's family and all that, and then yeah. get all that taco. Oh my god! I'm telling you, man, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta come down here, man. Well, dude, I, you know, I'll gain like a hundred pounds just like that. That's that's dangerous for me. <laughs> yeah, I guess not everybody's blessed with the uh, the hyperthyroid. No, no, definitely not me, man. Why do you think I have this beard? It's to hide these chipmunk cheeks, man. Sheesh. Yeah. It's dangerous. Dangerous. Oh. That's good stuff, man. Good stuff tonight. Pumped right up for this. Mm-hmm. I, I chugged a whole or, organic energy drink before this. I, I'm hyped up on Yerba Mate. Let's do this. <laughs> Rock and roll, man. Rock and roll. Are you? How's the hot sauce business? It's uh it's been pretty good. Um I'm going to, I'm looking for uh some new partners right now to do something different and a little bit better so I can uh, have a more, you know, smooth and streamlined operation. So, we'll see what happens with that. Right on, man. Well, when you get it up and running, we got to figure out a spaced out radio hot sauce. Oh, yeah, I'm I'm that'd be super cool. We've got some cool sauces that we never we haven't put out yet that we could probably brand for you if you'd be interested. I could send you some uh Samples and stuff. Yeah, just let me know, man. Because uh, I literally... Here, I'll show you here, brother. Uh, don't mind the mess there. See all the bottles there? Right up here. Uh, right over there. 
in the yeah, white yeah, container yeah. and all those on that bottom shelf. And I've got another 30 bottles upstairs that I'm working on. Or 24, pardon me, 24 bottles. That's uh, it's dedication right there, man. It's addiction. Absolute addiction. Insanity addiction, one of the two. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. Every meal, man. Every meal. You know, so I just collect the bottles. I'm all I'm all debating what to do with them. Because I'm starting to get more bottles than I have room. And so I'm trying to figure out, okay, do I hold on to the bottles or do I not? And just maybe see if some another collector wants them. But hold on, my friend. We're going to get going. Thank you to Todd, Fabster, and Smithy for the amazing super chats. Here we go with the second half hour. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Really appreciate you coming on in, hanging on out with us. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok, at Spaced Out Radio. We greatly appreciate it. From the swamp, we got Swamp Dweller tonight. Probably, in my opinion, the top creepypasta storyteller in YouTube land. Yeah, almost a quarter million subscribers tuning on in to his fascinating, creepy tales that he tells on a daily basis. Swamp Dweller, welcome back. Thanks for having me on again, Dave. No problem. Our chat room is, like, filled with your your, uh, supporters, man. This is really cool tonight. Well, it's great to see everybody here. I appreciate them all for following over. Right on. Well, we appreciate it too here, man. All right, let's get right into it because you have a plethora of stories. And anytime I get to use the word plethora, it it excites me. And, you know, you kind of follow the seasons, the holidays, the states, everything. And recently, just a few days ago, you put out a Thanksgiving horror stories. I want to learn about this. What kind of stories did you have on there? Um, it's kind of a, a mix of everything. That's that's why I love doing these uh these kind of niche topics because especially like the vague ones like Thanksgiving because you, like as long as it happens on Thanksgiving Day it fits. So like there's paranormal stories in there. There's like a, I believe a, a poltergeist type story in there. There's a, a home invasion story in there. There's a near death story in there. Um, there's a creepy deep wood story. There's a skimwalker story. There's there's all kinds of uh, – uh, like every story is different. I think that's what makes uh, the Swamp Dweller channel different than most other channels because it's not – you're not just going to find, you know, one specific type of story for, for each video. Right. I'm wondering, do you, do you, would you be okay if we actually played a little sample of a, of a story from your, your channel for our listeners who may not have tuned in before? Sure. Why not? All right. Let me just uh, fix this up here. All right. And we'll get this thing going. I'll tell you, if you haven't heard this, uh, his type of stories, I mean, it's absolutely amazing. I don't know why that's happening, but we're getting some feedback right there. I'll stop sharing that. We'll retry it here. See if we can uh, smarten this up a little bit. And all right, that looks better. And let's go to a story here. Hold on. Here we go. It's that time of year, my friends. It's time to chase down those turkeys, stuff them with some yellow food, and put them down your gullet. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. It's good to see you made it back for another episode. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true Thanksgiving horror stories. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. 
I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that truly help keep this show going on a daily basis. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy these creepy and allegedly true Thanksgiving Day Horror Stories. Hey Swamp Dweller, I love your stories, and as promised, I have a few stories of my own from South Carolina. I want to start off by saying that I am a female in my 30s. This happened when I was 11 or 12 though. My brothers and I are adopted from the Cherokee bloodline, and are very sensitive to unnatural things. So, our stories start at a young age, but it was something my adopted mom said at Thanksgiving that made me and my brothers look at each other with absolute fear that none of us had felt in many years. Mom told us that she had been having nightmares about a demonic looking dog creature with glowing yellow eyes since grandma had passed, and she was now living in her house. So, my brothers and I went outside to recant the issues we had at the time. As I said, I was 11 or 12, which means one brother was 10 and the other was 9. We had gone to grandma's every summer which was fine because grandma had a massive plot of land smack dab in the middle of nowhere. Our great uncle lived across the wood line and had cattle and chickens, and we would usually enjoy our time at his farm. An hour and a half of being stuck in the car, and we got to the farm. We still have a bit of time before the sun goes down, so we slipped into our muck boots and started walking around the great big field in front of grandma's house. Something had caught my attention on the other side of the area, though. My brother Jay then looked at me and asked, Kay, what did you see? I said nothing at first, and we continued to play for a bit, but I felt uneasy the entire time, as was my young brother. Something, it just felt like something, was watching us across that field. As it starts to get dark, my grandma lets the dogs out to come and try to retrieve us from playing, which was how we knew it was time to go home. No matter where we were in the woods, the swamp, or anywhere else on the property, the dogs would find us. So we get back to the house and we get ready for bed like usual. Now it's about nine o'clock on Thanksgiving evening and I hear one of the cows outside lowing very loudly, like she was being attacked or something. I look out my window and see some massive creature with yellow eyes attacking this poor cow, absolutely shredding it. The following day, my uncle came to the house and asked if we had seen anything in the pasture last night as one of the beef cows had been mutilated. I stay quiet, as my adopted family doesn't believe in supernatural things anyway, and I didn't want to be ridiculed anymore. He explained that he did not want us going into the woods until they figured out what was killing the cows. But a few days later, a farmer down the road saw a pack of coyotes, and I guess they got the blame. So after that, my brothers and I went into the woods, and we explored the area where I had seen this thing watching us the first day. We go about a hundred feet into the woods or so, and we came across a large bramble patch that looked like it had been molded into the shape of a cave. A thing about these brambles is that unless you have incredibly thick leather work gloves, you will bleed from the inch to inch and a half long briars. Immediately, my brother G starts to cry. He just can't bring himself to talk, and he just stands there and starts to cry. J and I get to G, and we try to get him to tell us what is happening, but he cannot compose himself. As we began to walk away from this cave structure, my grandma sends the dogs out, signaling it was time for lunch. At this point, we had a black chow lab mix named Molly, and a smaller white and red mix named Sandy, neither of which would have harmed us. Now, I bring this up because Molly was tearing through the trees as if something had been ready to attack us. Molly was my dog and very protective of me. As soon as my lovable pooch gets to us, she starts growling, and she starts hurting all three of us back toward the house. I stopped to see what my beloved dog was flipping out about, and she bit my pant leg and started dragging me right out of the woods. We get back to the yard, and G is finally calm enough to tell us that he swears he heard our grandmother calling us from the swamp, further in. J and I look at each other and scratch our heads. We hadn't heard grandma at all. That night, my brothers and I were a bit restless. And as soon as it was summer and we had no actual bedtime, we decided to play ghost in the graveyard in front of the house. We get the torchlight, and I am it, of course. So we never really go too far from the house at night, especially after that. So we play at the front, 
knowing that it is safer, as there are wild animals in this part of the state as well. I call out. All are free to end the game after ten minutes of not finding each other. The guys come back to the front of the house when we hear my voice from the woods call, All free! We stop, and I point the ample light toward where my voice came from. In the morning, we see a vast, looming figure, dark as sin with large, yellow eyes call out again, All's free! We got our asses inside and stayed there for the rest of the night. Even to this day, sometimes when we go out there, we have seen the eyes and hear my 12-year-old voice call out, All's free! So, to the creature in the woods, I don't know what it is, but I don't ever want to meet it. My goodness, man. That is chilling. Chilling! Yeah, man, that was a great story, and I was really excited to share that one. It's one of my favorite ones I've probably shared in a while. When I hear somebody get that intimate about their story and the real detail that it, that you put into the story and that maybe the people are putting into the stories, I mean, I mean the stories, I don't know how other people react to it, but for me, I, I feel like I'm sucked right in, like watching this movie play out as you're dictating what's happening, man. Yeah, I really try to read each story from like a first person point of view. I try to I try to embrace it and and tell it like it was happening to me. Like, you know, that's why I try to inject that emotion in there and those stutters and stammers and just try to make it feel like, you know, somebody is reciting their story to you instead of me just telling a story. Right. No, it totally works. Totally works. So for Thanksgiving, I mean, what other kind of stories are you hiding in there for us? Can you give us one? Um, you want me to tell a specific story or whatever one comes to your mind? Um, there is one that I wanted to share on the, on it, but it was, it was too short. It was like only two sentences, but it was this, uh, lady who, uh, moved into this like old, like, I guess, you know, where like the pilgrims and like the uh, Native Americans had that, that dinner or whatever, the massacre that happened right after it and all that. Um, they had like a, a little cabin in that area and apparently, on Thanksgiving, it was either like in the evening or the morning, I can't remember, they uh, woke up and then in the middle of their living room, there were these uh, Native Americans um, doing doing something in the center of the room. I can't exactly remember. And when they turned on the lights, they disappeared in front of them. And uh, it was short, sweet, and just kind of like very basic. But to me, it was just like such a cool and interesting story. I really wished it was longer and had more details so I could have put it in the video. No kidding. No kidding. Do you ever get the, a lot of those stories where you're like, man, this sounds amazing, and then they just like cut it off after like a short paragraph, and you're like, where's the rest? Yeah, yeah, all the time. There's so many really short ones. Like, there's a, especially when it comes to like the skinwalker, not deer type stuff. Like, they're so short. That's like I have to like like find like 15 of them. Like, I have to wait like forever sometimes for people to send in enough stories just so I can make it like a decent enough length for you guys. No kidding. Well, I could just imagine. Have you ever emailed back someone and and is like, dude, where where's the rest? I need this story. Oh, all the time. Um, all the time. Like, if there's like a story that's really good, I'll be like, can you please elaborate a little bit more, put a little bit more detail? Because um, I understand a lot of people aren't authors, so a, a lot of times, you know, if you can just send me um, the basic details, I can put it together and make it something readable. Were you always a writer, a creative writer, or was this something you had to find within yourself? This is actually something that I uh, I, I just kind of fell into and started doing. Not necessarily, I guess, I always liked doing like book reports, you know what I mean? But like I never did them that often unless I had to. So when I, and I always loved writing like poetry and like lyrics for and for songs and such like that. So I, I was always a writer in a sense, but like I was never like a storyteller, you know? And when it came to this type of stuff, it really, I guess, like b created that spark because, you know, now I've been, I've written hundreds of scripts for true crime stuff. I've written tons of stories. I've, you know, edited thousands upon thousands of stories. And uh, it's just been like a, a spark, I guess, that was really ignited and like became like a passion over this whole Swamp Dweller journey. Do you mind if we play 
one of these not deer stories because you have had uh, a lot of talk about them tonight already, and I would love the audience to hear one. Sure. All right, let's get to it. Things happen there. Maybe I will share those stories in some other videos. But one night, I was left perplexed by something I saw from my bedroom window. This old house did not have central air. Although I had a window unit in my bedroom, I liked to shut it off and open my window on cool, breezy nights. I loved listening to the sounds of nature. Surrounding the dead-end road, there were many miles of woods. Seeing coyote, raccoon, possum, and deer were an everyday occurrence. There were many times throughout many nights where the woods would go silent. I would think most of you know when the woods go silent, there's usually a predator of some kind nearby. One night, I had my windows up. It's after midnight and I'm just browsing Pinterest on my phone, when the woods suddenly go quiet. It seemed like five minutes or so before I actually noticed how long everything had been silent. You could have heard a pin drop. Normally the woods would go silent for a couple of minutes. Being curious and wondering if coyotes were sniffing around my front porch again, I got up and looked out my bedroom window that faces the front of the house. Now at this time, I can't remember if I had started listening to these kinds of podcasts yet, so I'm not sure if I had heard your stories about wendigos or not deer creatures. Listening to one of your latest podcasts made me remember this event and realized what I saw may be one of these creatures I've been hearing about. For context, the road from the front of the house was paved and went straight into a portioned Y off into our driveway, to the left. The other portion went straight ahead to the right, and the Y turned into a dirt and gravel road. When I looked at the window, everything was still silent, and I was surprised to see what appeared to be a very large and lonely buck walking down the middle of the road towards the dirt road straight ahead. I watched it, finding it strange that it was alone. Normally, when you see one deer, there's at least a few close by. As I watched it walking towards the dirt road, I thought it looked strange. First off, I'll admit, I'm no hunter, but this buck looked to be massive, easily two or three times larger than what might be considered average. Not only was it incredibly large, but the way it walked. It was like it was being worked like a string puppet or like it was in some sort of trance or maybe even how a soldier would march. It never turned and looked at me. It never made a sound. I just stood there, rubbing my eyes in disbelief trying to figure out what the heck I was seeing. I was 100% sober during this, just a heads up, and I hadn't really smoked a drink at all at that point in my life. Just as I was reaching the point to where I wouldn't be able to see it anymore from my window, I looked around. I'm not sure, maybe I was trying to see another deer or something. This was only for a second, and when I looked back, it was gone. There's no way it could have left my line of sight that quickly. That's when I realized, I never heard his footsteps. This thing actually never made a sound. And just then, suddenly, the wood sprang back to life, and I almost jumped out of my skin from being so spooked. I just stood at my window, feeling bewildered. What the hell did I just see? Whatever it was, it was definitely not a deer. This thing made the forest, which was usually very loud at night, go dead quiet. The way it walked, its size, how it just disappeared... The whole situation was just so bizarre. I thought about telling my roommate what I saw, but he was a non-sensitive person and not a big believer in the unknown. Although, a year or two later when the house was being renovated, he started to believe. But hey, that's another story. So, there it is. My not deer sighting. As I said, it's not necessarily the scariest story, but it's definitely a head-scratcher. Do any of you have a similar story? Can anyone tell me? What they think I saw, or what they think the not deer was doing, marching down the road just to disappear. I just have this sickening feeling that if I made a sound or engaged with it, the situation would have escalated. I was always under the impression that there might be a portal on the property for spirits or unknown beings to come and go through. Is that what the not deer was doing? Just taking the portal back to hell for a dinner arrangement with Satan? Please share your thoughts and stay strange. Awesome. Absolutely awesome, man. I don't know how you do it. Don't know how you do it, man, but that is phenomenal. I'm glad you enjoy him, Dave. Yeah, I, I really do. I, I can't get enough. Can't get enough. 
For you, okay, as we got uh, just a couple minutes to go here before we got to go to break at the top of the hour, I'm 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 very curious uh, for you. Uh, you have this one character that you have, and this is this is he's part of a group called the Hunters, and he's been sending you. I know I asked you this about him last time, but I'm I'm just absolutely intrigued by this gentleman. You know. You, you know who I'm talking about. Oh, uh, yeah. You're talking about my good friend, Mr. Sam White Owl. Oh, you know, he, he's probably in my top 10 of people I want to interview right now. I wish he was, I wish he was more public, that's for sure. But um, he's definitely more active and sending in letters again. I actually just got the third one for season two here. And um, it's going to be about a creature that most people have probably never heard of and I don't know too much about, but I've been educated through um, my good friend Sam uh, called the Zabrak. So I think it's going to be a very interesting episode coming out here very soon. Now, what what amazes me about this is he talks about this this group called the Hunters. What is this? Have you investigated this group? Um, I've done some research into it, and I've uh, definitely seen some things that are interesting. Um, the, when it comes to vetting certain things, and especially when it comes to uh, finding information about things that kind of seem fantastic, sometimes you'll be surprised what you actually find. And um, there are several groups that, um, across the world for many, many generations that have allegedly been monster hunters that uh, work in conjunction with each other. And uh, it is my belief that that is the uh, hunter group that Sam is referring to. Yeah, I would love to find find this group. Like, How do you become a part of these groups that he calls the hunters? Um, Sam has entered this a few times and from what I gather, it's more of a, they'll kind of find it, they'll find you kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not, there's not really like a straightforward application process. Wouldn't you love to be a part of that team though? Oh, that would be awesome. You know, but at the same time, uh, for these stories that I've read, uh, we're, we're about to be 13 stories into it. And to be honest, I, I do not envy Sam's job. No. How much do you believe that he's telling you the truth? That he goes out there looking for all these mystical creatures to to literally either communicate with them, to talk them off the ledge from killing people, to having to sometimes get a little violent with these? I think there is always a grain of truth in just about every story. And uh, at the end of the day, it, it is entertainment, like I said. So, you know, if, if Sam White Owl doesn't turn out to be an actual monster hunter that's out there, you know, throwing fists with Sasquatch, I'm not going to be too upset. But <laughs> I do think there is some... Uh, I do think there is some grain of truth to these stories. Uh, they're incredibly accurate to the lore. Um, I always vet everything he says about the uh, creatures down to the uh, the backstory to the descriptions that are known about them. And uh, it's always incredibly accurate. And, uh, you know, I think that there is, it's either a very incredibly researched writing project or there is some truth to it. Wow. Wow. I could, it, this totally intrigues me, man. I, I know that, that uh, you have a personal relationship with him. So Sam White Owl, if you're listening, man, I would love the opportunity to sneak in an interview with you to learn about the hunters. That's for sure. Yeah, but for you, I mean, the, the letters that he sends you, I mean, these are pages upon pages. Like, he goes into great detail. Oh, yeah. Many of the episodes are well over an hour and a half long. Um, I even have, uh, I have the entire first season, uh, 10 letters in a, in a video together. So you don't even have to skip through them. And that one's like, like an eight hour video. Um, this next one's probably going to be over an hour long. Um, these episodes minimum are like 45 minutes. So he goes in, he, he spares no, uh, he spares nothing. He, he goes all the way in and he just gives you every detail possible. No kidding. My friend, I'm going to get you to hold on right there, 
as we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. Swamp Dweller is here. He's one of the top channels when it comes to creepypasta stories on YouTube. If you haven't heard them, you're missing out. If you like to be freaked out by monster stories, he's the man who's going to tell them to you. So make sure you go to his channel, hit subscribe, ring the bell when you know his episodes are coming on. More with Swamp Dweller in Hour 2 of Spaced Out Radio next. I feel kind of bad, man. I got that uh, idea right uh, right during the show, and I kind of put you on the spot of playing some of yours. I hope that didn't piss you off. Oh, no, that's fine. I, I don't mind. Um, I'm actually going to be right back. I'm going to go grab some water real quick. Yeah, no problem. I am so addicted to his channel. So addicted. Smoky Mountain Wanderer, how you doing, buddy? The gorgeous and talented Kira, how are you? Oh, the clam has sent me the password for tonight. Look at that. Oh, hey, clam. But this, uh, this group of the hunters... We got to do some investigating in there, man. I'd like to know more about this. Uh, Gary the Dutchman. Well, well, the Dutchman's here. You ever figure out how you want to piss off a Dutchman? Well, what you want to do is affect their wallet. Because the Dutch people, especially people like Gary, they have no problem reaching into your wallet in order to get as much cash as they can. But we figured out a way in order to get your money back. Use promo code SOR2019. That's SOR2019. Go to Mighty Moose Beard. <coughs> Excuse me. I get so excited I can't even talk. Go to MightyMooseBeard.com. Hit up Gary the Dutchman for some beard oil. And ladies, it works fantastic in your hair. I got the true north here. If you want to smell like a Canadian... Not a Dutchman, a Canadian. You you put some of this stuff on. Let me show you. You just drop it right in your hand like so. You rub it in your hands, and you just massage it in. Massage it in. That's it. That's all you do. And Gary the Dutchman gets pissed off every time I do this commercial for him because he knows it's costing him money. He knows. You know, he's got to give out. You're going to use the promo code. He's got to give out a a discount, right? He hates it. So go to MightyMooseBeard.com, get your oil, you rub it in your hair. It's great. It's all natural, no chemicals. Your hair looks great. Your beard smells great, if you have a beard. And you get to piss off a Dutchman as well. It's a win-win-win. MightyMooseBeard.com. Check it on out today. There you go, Gar. All right. And who came in here? Uh, yeah. Oh, there's gorgeous DM. She is our resident Red Deer Rebel. Wearing number nine in your program. Number nine. She's not related to the Sutter family, though. Mm-hmm. Mm. Shame. Yeah. Are you a hockey fan? Uh, I know nothing about hockey. All I know is that it's two street gangs giving non-lethal spears that fight each other for dominance. Yeah, it used to be that way. It's not that way On anymore. Ice. Not that way anymore. I can't stand hockey now. I love hockey, the game, but this whole pussyfooting around and crying to referees, don't like it. Don't like it a bit. Drop your gloves yeah. like a man. Take a couple of punches. That's what the game is all about. Hi, gorgeous Nicole Perron, fellow Canadian. Oh, hey, Clam. And uh, Adam Robbins, good to see you. Stephen Bonang, how you doing, my fellow Canuck? Mama Susan grew up with the Sutters. Believe it or not, Mama Susan, my grandfather used to bale hay with their grandfather. Yeah, back in uh, Viking, Alberta. 
My grandfather's from Beggarville. Wow. Fun fact, my grandfather was my grandfather. No. Yeah. Mm. All right, buddy. I bet I blew some minds there. That was huge. Huge. <clears throat> All right. Mm-hmm. Jewel says, Dutchman Gary works really hard at extracting moose oil. You don't want to know more. That's true. Hi, Shar. How are you? And Oob to slap shot there. Hey, I get my Kubasa from Stanichi's Dirty Filth. Get it shipped out to British Columbia. My dad does. I know Stanichi's well. Best Kubasa you'll ever get. Or Kolbasa for your English people. All right. Uh, yeah. Gorgeous Lala B. The stunning and talented Nicole Sackich. How you doing? Uh, we got about one minute, Swampy. All right. Mm-hmm. In fact, Filth, I got about five rings of sausage in my freezer right now from Stanichi's. Take that, buddy. Take that. I know you're jealous. All right. Big thank you to Spooky Morales, Todd Purden, Fabster, and Smithy for the awesome super chats. It's a great way to uh, support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you so much to those who choose to hit that super chat button. We really appreciate it. All the new listeners checking us out for the first time. Thank you for hitting the subscribe button and ringing the bell. We really do appreciate it. We're here seven nights a week for your listening entertainment. And of course you can do some shopping. We're, we're just changing over gear into our new store. Oh, hold on. Can't start the show. Gail has messaged us. Oh, Thank you, Gail. We'll be breaking that here in a little bit here. Here we go, everyone, with Hour 2. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth, hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Just go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Nectari Voris. Nectari Voris is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as a clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok as of right now at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with the man, the myth, and the creepy pasta legend. Swamp Dweller is his name and the name of his channel. As you should, go there, hit subscribe if you like spooky, scary, weird, freaky stories. And he's here to tell us all about them. And of course, you want to go to his YouTube channel, Swamp Dweller, and hit that subscribe button. He's almost at 250,000 subscribers. We want to help him with our audience to go over there. and let, Let's try and get him past that 250,000 mark. I think we need that. Swamp, welcome back. Good to be here, Dave. Good to be here. Mm-hmm. So let, let's be honest. Were, were you subscriber number one to your channel? Um, probably. I, I'm not. I don't really remember to be honest, but I probably was. I guess. I'm not gonna lie. I was subscriber number one to ours. You know, but we're there's winning. no shame in that. You got you got to be your own biggest fan. You know yeah. what I mean? That's how you get. That's how you get through the day. I, Hyping yourself up. I sent myself a thank you for subscribing, to be honest. No, uh, no, I didn't really, but I just thought that would be funny. All right. Right around the corner, we have Christmas. And, of course, we got to get through this week, which is, you know, Thanksgiving in the United States on Thursday. And then, of course, Black Friday, my favorite American holiday of the year. Love it. Love it. But we'll get into that later. Then comes the run to Christmas. 
You got any good Christmas stories you'd like to share with us? Um, yeah, I've got quite a few I could share probably. Um, one of my favorite ones is this, uh, have you, do you know what Krampus is? Yes. So for everybody familiar with Krampus or unfamiliar with Krampus, it's basically, uh, like a pagan deity that's kind of always been known to kind of go along with St. Nicholas and, uh, St. Nicholas, you know, rewards the children, giving them gifts. Krampus, uh, eats the children that are bad and such. And, uh, um, there is a story that was sent to me the first year I was doing this, and I did these uh, Christmas stories. Uh, apparently, somebody was staying in this little cabin in the middle of the woods like they did every year with their family. And um, in the middle of the night, they uh, they were sleeping, and it was Christmas night or a Christmas Eve or whatever you want to call it. Um, and... They hear these like loud thump, th- like th- 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 they hear these loud thumping noises on the top of their roof, and uh, it sounds like hooves, and it sounds like it's walking uh, slowly but very heavily. It sounds like it's uh, being very deliberate with where it's stepping, but it wants you to hear it. Is what they were saying. It, that it was just like a very deliberate sound, and it would go for hours and hours. And uh, right as dusk would happen, they hear it jump off the roof and land in front of the door. And this thing starts beating on the door, trying to open it with all its might. And it's beating it so much that they think the hinges are literally about to get ripped off. And uh, they look out the window to try to see what it is. And they describe what they see as the silhouette of what you would you what you would commonly see described as Krampus. This thing looks over at them with these glowing red eyes and then jumps away and runs into the woods. And uh, it's one of those uh, stories that stuck out with me, especially for uh, Christmas, because... Uh, Ever since then, I'm always looking for at least one good Krampus story to have every year. Man, I didn't think Krampus was in North America. Yeah, it's usually um, it's usually like an Alps thing, you know. But um, it's very uh, interesting how things seem to spread far and wide these days, especially when it comes to folklore. No kidding, no kidding. Do a lot of monsters come out at Christmas time? It seems so. It seems when it gets colder, especially in a lot of rural areas, you'll start seeing a lot of, uh, you know, Wendigo encounters and uh, not deer, tall deer encounters. And uh, you get those Bigfoot encounters start running up in the in the winter and fall time. So I think it's uh, I think when the bears go to sleep, the Bigfoots come out to play, so to speak. Really? So what you're saying is we need to start leaving Christmas presents out for Bigfoot. At this time of year. Yes. Hmm. I don't even know what to put on Bigfoot's Christmas list. Like, what do you leave out for him? You leave him Chad Smith. Ooh. Dropping a Chad Smith like that is major. That is majorly large right there. Majorly large. You know, and and that's just going to make Chad's head just get bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, honestly, honestly, that's just amazing for people who are, are getting ready for the holidays. You know, do you have any trolls or gremlin stories that you could share with us? Because of course, if you go back into the 1980s, you're probably too young for that, but the movie gremlins came out at Christmas time, but you're not supposed to drop water on them at that point. Otherwise bad stuff happens. You got any troll stories you would share with us? I am familiar with the Gremlins movies, one of my favorite ones growing up. Um, Troll stories, they're uh, a dime a dozen, honestly, but I don't get sent. I feel like I'm one of the few channels that don't really get sent them, but I see them on other crypto channels all the time. But um, the only troll story I can really think of that I remember is there was a, a friend of mine that I used to actually know personally who, when he was younger, he grew up on a Native American reservation in Oklahoma. And uh, he, well, I guess it's not a reservation, but technically the whole state's a reservation, but that's a different topic. Um, But he he grew up on this Native American community area, and uh, there was this bench by this garden by his grandfather's house. And one day he was walking down this dirt path, and he sees what looks like this... uh, this like little person type troll type thing. It was like probably like maybe four feet tall and it was, uh, 
it just looked like a troll. He said, you know, it had like these weird pointy ears and it had like this, uh, large nose and its eyes were like, they, they seemed to be larger than that of a human's. And they were like more just like kind of black and beady more than, you know, like a human's would have like a color in the iris and such like that. And, um, he described it as kind of looking at him and when it realized that he was looking at it, it tried to hide behind the bench. And when he ran to the bench to see what it was, it was gone. But there was uh, what looked like to be indents in the ground where it was standing. Oh my. I don't know if I want to come up with something like that, man. I'll, I'll take, oh, no. I'll take Bigfoot over something small and trollish anytime. I really would. Oh, yeah, the first thing, I'm just like, that's a goblin. And it's like, I'm, I'll be out of there. I'll be running. Right. Me too, man. Me too. All right. I got a question from Aiden for you. Have you, Swamp Dweller, ever come across anything like alien monster scary stories that you could share? Um, I've done UFO stories plenty of times. I've done a few alien encounter stories. I've actually got to uh, a long time ago in a, a documentary, I got to uh, interview the first ever alien abductees. Um, interesting alien stories. I can't really like, they're all kind of the same. Honestly, most of the time it's, uh, either they feel like they were abducted and they see things through their dreams or there's, uh, they see these things that people call grays where it's these long skinny, um, sometimes short kind of alien things with these like big round heads and giant black eyes. I've, I've got those sent a ton of times. But um, none of them, I've never been sent one that I can really think of at the top of my head that like stands out, you know, it's, they're kind of, I, I feel like that's kind of more one of the lesser topics I get sent. What's the strangest creature that you've ever received a story on? Mm, man, that's really hard. There's a lot of really weird descriptions. I've been, I've been sent things that like, when people are describing them, it's like the head of a moose, the legs of an alligator. Like, it's like, what, what are you, what are you seeing? Like, sometimes I feel like people are, uh, might be smoking something, but, um, <laughs> uh, honestly, I, I would have to say as of recently, one that I've looked into it, that I don't really, I don't really have a name for it, but it's like, it's this creature that people are describing has like 10 sets of wings. It's, it's got like five sets of eyes and its body is like, a amorphous mass so it doesn't really have a specific shape and to me it sounds like depictions of uh what in the bible of uh angels almost and it's just uh very disturbing oh my goodness man okay another question coming from arlene who is asking have you ever ran across a story so freaky that you just couldn't use it um, I, I don't think so. No. Um, I have, there have been stories that like I've cut up because they were a little too graphic, but, um, I don't think there's ever been one that was like too freaky. I think the freakier, the better. Like if it's something that's like, you know, wilder than anything I've ever done before, I'm probably going to be more apt to want to use it. Is there any stories like that that stand out to you after the thousands you've done? Um, yes, there was a story, uh, sent in to me. Um, have you ever, I think this actually happened in Canada. Um, it was like a guy who like decapitated somebody on a bus and was like cannibalizing them. Um, I actually got sent a story of that incident from somebody who was on the bus. Oh no. Yeah. That, that's one that's, that stood out the most. It's probably one of the most gruesome stories I've ever read because it was down to the T like very traumatic for this person. Well, you know that gentleman who he actually, the gentleman who committed the crime. So this is going back to, I believe, Winnipeg, Manitoba on a Greyhound bus, probably yeah. eight, 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, 15 years ago, where a gentleman had a psychotic episode on the bus and he actually cut the head off of an innocent stranger who was sitting by him on the bus. And then they, he held the bus hostage, and they ended up getting the hostages out. And he and uh, defense won a case for insanity. And that man now is a free man. Yeah, it's it's a insane world we live in sometimes when it comes to crime and the court systems. Oh, trust me, 
if this guy was in the U.S., he'd be locked up forever. But not here in Canada. Nope. He is free to walk around. Mm Mm-hmm. I know. It's terrible. Absolutely terrible. But nonetheless, let's move on here in your stories here because you have, uh, you, you hit topics a lot of, you know, different types of trail systems, national parks. It also ties into the missing 411 cases. Is there a missing 411 case that's really had you scratching your head? Uh, the Dennis Martin one, I would say, really was what got me into the missing 411 phenomenon. And it just forever has me scratching my head that some that a child can disappear and uh, never be found, even though he was literally right there. It's like one moment they're there, one, and then they're gone. And I believe last time I was on, we talked about stories like that where, that I've shared in the past where, like, you know, their child's there, they're missing, and then they'll appear hours later like nothing ever happened, but people were going crazy looking for them. And uh, sometimes they just never reappear. And to me, it's just whether I feel like I don't know if it's cave systems underground, if it's Bigfoot or if there's something else going on. But it's just uh, definitely tragic, but it's head scratching and mind boggling. No kidding. It really is. What, What do you think's happening to these people? Do you think they're being kidnapped by aliens or Bigfoot? Dogman, maybe, or do you think that they're walking into through a portal into a different dimension? I think it's a mix of everything. I think it's uh, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. I think, you know, it's uh, the elements. I feel like it's the weather. I feel like predators here and there. Um, I feel like people getting hurt, and uh, I feel like people getting all, going off trails like they do often. Then I obviously feel like maybe some of these cave systems underground, if you look at the clusters of uh, where these people go missing, uh, it actually g- aligns with the uh, underground cave systems. Then I also think... Who knows? Maybe maybe there are these cryptids or these uh, aliens or these portals out there where people are falling through. Maybe, maybe there are things taking people. I think it's a little bit of everything. I don't think there's one specific you know, answer to what's going on. Well, our good friend Steve Stockton from Missing Persons Mysteries, he has actually been doing a lot of investigating over the years on the Dennis Martin case. And he might be somebody uh, you could get some info from. If you, if you need on that. Oh, definitely. For sure. Swamp Dweller is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Make sure you hit him up and, and hit, subscribe to his channel. I know a number of people in our chat room have already tonight, which is really cool. All right, let, let's move on here. We've touched on Christmas stories. We've touched on other kinds of uh, stories like Thanksgiving and everything like that. But Aiden here wants to know, have you ever had any clown stories come across your desk? Actually, yeah. One of the uh, earliest stories ever submitted to me was uh, a story of a, of a clown that stalked somebody and uh, even tried to break into their house uh, for no real reason. It was just uh, one of those random crimes where somebody just saw, saw this person and decided to target them and to uh, try to break into their house. And uh, luckily, uh, they scared them off when the police came. And uh, I'm not sure if they ever got caught, but they were dressed as a clown the entire time. So very interesting. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I hated that whole clown thing. Hated it. Uh, I, I hate I hate clowns. I honestly, uh, I don't, I'm not scared of them. I just hate how they act personally, it's just like, it just annoys me. They're just too loud. Oh, you know, I love those videos on YouTube when the clown thing was going on where, where people were actually getting out of their vehicles and beating the tar out of these clowns. You know, I loved it because the clowns were just so creepy and, and they were taking it further and further and further and further on on trying to get to people. And finally, people had enough and were like getting out of their cars or running them over or whatever. I know that sounds bad and morbid, but I was like, finally, the little guy's winning one here. You know, finally, we could do this. Just hate clowns. Hate them. Scare the tar out of me. All right, let's move on here on Spaced Out Radio. Swamp Dweller is our guest tonight. You have done series of states across north america or pardon me across the united states from washington all the way down to florida is there a state where there's a lot more weirdness happening um 
aside from Florida, um, yeah, I would say uh, I'd say Alaska has some really weird stories. Um, that's actually probably the most popular one in the series so far. Uh, Arizona had some really weird ones. Um, Washington for sure. Um, I would say those ones stick out the most. What do you think makes those states so particularly weird? Um, I think it's uh, a mix of the culture, and uh, a lot of those places are – like Alaska, like there's not a lot known about it. Not a lot of people actually live in Alaska, and it's just steeped in folklore and mystery, and uh, it's just one of those places that I think the imagination runs wild. Arizona is steeped in Native American lore, Navajo lore, Ute lore, stuff like that. You know, you got skimwalkers. You've got everything over there, right? And then uh, places like Washington, it's just uh, a crazy culture. You got the Pacific Northwest, uh, those thick, thick woods, famous for Bigfoot. You know, um, I just feel like it's uh, these are certain states that just have the this energy and this imagination to it. And uh, Florida, you know, you just got Florida man and you know wild stuff going on down here. Yeah, Florida man is nuts, nuts. How do you put up with that? Um, it's my people and, uh, it's entertainment and, uh, just as long as you keep your head down, you'll be fine. Yeah. Otherwise somebody will chew your nose off. Had enough, oh, of those, yeah. had enough of those stories on here. We got to get back to Florida man stories. I'm not done with those yet. Totally not done, but we'll, we'll move on here. You know, uh, I'm surprised you didn't mention Ohio in all of that because Ohio seems to be one screwed up state. It definitely is. Uh, Ohio's is one of those places where I feel like it was one of the episodes where it was mainly just like a lot of creepy people and weird people and stuff like that. It wasn't more, you know, I feel like Ohio kind of just has, it's like Florida 2.0 at this point, you know? Well, I mean, when you consider the fact that they've got the dog man, they've got the Bigfoot, they've got uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base where allegedly there's aliens, you got the frogmen, you got a little bit of everything over there. It's not surprising that people are disturbed from Ohio. Oh, yeah. You know, you got the grass man running around. It's just terrible, terrible. <laughs> For you, uh, and we got about two and a half minutes here, you've also done stories per month, like January, February, right through December. Is there a month that is more spooky than others? Honestly, I feel like fall is the the most spooky time of the year. Once we start getting, you know, the the, the world starts cooling down, and uh, uh, I just feel like that's when a lot of scary things come out. Um, it seems fall or autumn, whatever you want to call it, seems to be the spookiest time of year. Like uh, I'd say October, November definitely has a lot of the creepier stories, especially when it comes to the not deer sightings and the, uh, the cryptid sightings in general. Like I said, it seems when the bears go to sleep, the Sasquatch come out to play. Hmm. With all these creatures running around that you have heard of over the years, has it ever intensified your own personal desires to get out there and investigate? I know you don't have time, but I mean, what does it set you off? Yeah, there's been times where uh, it's made me want to go out and do some of these documentaries. Like I, I did a documentary on the St. John's River Monster where I went out to locations and uh, we, we scuba dived, we got on boats, we uh, you know went out there and uh, interviewed people who had, you know knew about the sightings and the folklore or have seen them themselves. And uh, it was just an entirely different experience. And uh, things like these stories will definitely uh, inspire me to do that from time to time. Well, that's kind of cool. I mean, have you have you gone on any investigations, like for Bigfoot or the down in Florida? I guess the swamp ape. Um, not particularly. Like, I'm I'm not really, I guess, somebody who like goes hunting for things. But I've definitely been out, um, like in the swamps and uh, in the woods and such at nighttime. And uh, we've been kind of just seeing what we see, you know, just kind of exploring uh, with no, no real goal in mind. But there's definitely been times where I've been in areas that are famous, uh, especially I've been in the Pine Barrens in the middle of the night with nothing but a GoPro and a flashlight. And uh, we just kind of walk through it just to see what we would see and what we would hear and such like that. But uh, I've never gone like in particular to actually like hunt, you know, or uh, go on expedition for something in particular. It's just more just like, let's see what happens kind of thing. 
Well, you get a lot of stories coming to you that keep you very interested and keep you very entertained, and, and you're keeping us very entertained tonight on Spaced Out Radio. The man, the myth, the creepy pasta legend, Swamp Dweller, is here tonight on Spaced Out Radio, sharing some of his spooky experiences from stories from people like you that have emailed him their tales of true monster terror. Space Down Radio continues, and while you're on the break, make sure you go over to Swamp Dweller's channel on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, because it's a channel you want to be subscribed to. Space Down Radio continues after this. All right, brother, we got five minutes. Awesome, good stuff. Right on. Good crowd tonight. Thank you all for being here. It's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. A rowdy bunch of uh, commenters tonight. Oh, yeah. They're right into you, man. Beautiful. Of course. I think it is. Let's see here. Do you still keep count of your subscribers or do you even not even pay attention to it? Um, not really. Um, to be honest, I, I subscribers to me don't really mean that much. It's not like YouTube notifies people and such. So it's more of just kind of like an uphill battle with that kind of stuff. And I feel like it just, it, it pushes creator burnout more than anything. Cause you're just setting yourself up for disappointment. I mean, I, I look at it and I, I like to obviously see things go up and see things in the green and keep things consistent, but I don't have like particular like go, like subscriber milestones or anything like that. It's just uh, cool to see it growing and uh, that kind of thing. I don't know. I just try not to focus because it really does uh, just bring you down most of the time and kind of it's just like an unhealthy mindset to care about those kind of things. Yeah. Well, we're 70 away from 14,000. I never thought we'd have 14,000, man. Oh, yeah. That's awesome, man. It's a blessing. That's for sure. Beautiful. It is. It's kind of cool. And uh, I'm hoping that we can continue to grow. Hopefully, one day, we can get into your type of territory. That would be awesome. You know? Oh, yeah. I just got to figure out that catch. You know what I'm saying? Like, we Mm -hmm. do the show nightly. But, like, with you, I mean, like, looking at your videos, I mean, God, you got videos that have been seen hundred thousand times plus you know i mean forty three thousand thirty four thousand eighty three thousand ninety thousand like wow man wow yeah it's crazy sometimes i see um how many people have seen some of these videos like when i go to like my most viewed ones and then i see like uh one we got a few that are coming up close to a million and i'm just like that's insane to think that a million people have watched that video it's just no kidding i never i never set out obviously for that to happen i never even remotely thought that would be a thing um when i first started i, I thought like you know if i ever hit 10,000 subscribers that i'll feel you know i'll feel accomplished and the fact that we've done that like 200 times you know what i mean like is uh absolutely just you know very humbling 10 scary and strange park ranger story horror stories 845,000 views holy cow you you got to celebrate if this thing hits a million i think it will eventually that'll be a a, good, a big day good day i'm excited for it i haven't watched that one yet that's that's an I'm, old one yeah that's what i'm doing tonight that's what i'm doing tonight Definitely. It's one of the ones that started it for sure. The uh, Park Ranger stories were one of the first things that really popped off for me. Mm-hmm. I could see that. I could see that. All right. Yeah, it was a crazy time for sure. We got uh, just over 90 seconds. Definitely. <clears throat> I got to get back to them sometimes. It's uh used to be able to interview a lot of Park Rangers. Got so many cool stories, but... It's just uh, hard to do those kind of things when you don't have as much time. I bet. It, uh, I bet. 
Chad Smith says, I'm Swamp Dweller. Look at that. We're all Swamp Dweller. If you live in if you dwell in the swamp with me, you're a subscriber, you're a swamp dweller. We're all swamp dweller. It's beautiful. It is, man. You got a beautiful community. Hi there. Gorgeous thin Lizzie Borden has returned. Uh Tits McGee filling in for Veronica Corningstone tonight. Come on, Anchorman. Anytime you drop an Anchorman notion in this chat room, it is getting on the air. I'm going to tell you that right now. Anything Anchorman is going to get on the air. Right on. Says, it's awesome. Reminds me of good Art Bell times, listening while my dad drove truck all over the country. We're glad you found us. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, ring the bell. We are here seven days a week. Jeff Steve Garvey will get to your question next. And, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah. Um, no, I did not eat breakfast for dinner tonight. I never will. Swamp Dweller's a breakfast for dinner guy. I don't. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'll commit the sin. I don't care. I just like food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. All right. Here we He's go, everyone. Here we go. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok, at Spaced Out Radio. Patience with me, trying to figure out how to make videos on that thing. So, yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. That's all I'll say. Just hit subscribe. We'd appreciate it. Swamp Dweller is here tonight on Spaced Out Radio, sharing some spooky, creepy pasta stories from all over North America and the world. We love this man around here. Almost 250,000 subscribers on his channel. This man does this for a living, taking your stories and emails and turning them into pieces of verbal art that you can check out on his channel I mean, his videos are incredible. Anything you want to hear, it is right there. He is a great YouTube influencer. Swamp Dweller, welcome back. Good to be back. Let's get to a question from Jeff here. Swamp, do you consider the Pine Barrens as one of the scariest forests around? Definitely. Um, The Pine Barrens were a place that were definitely beautiful. Like it was nice and scenic and something that was amazing to experience, but it definitely had like very weird and ominous vibes and specific spots for sure when I was hiking through it. And rumor has it that Chad Smith is going to be used as Bigfoot bait by you. Oh, the, 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 these are facts, but it's also propaganda by the the anti Chad Smith gang out there. So don't don't let them fool you. We're not using him as bait. It's just a decoy. You see. I see what you're doing. I see where you're going with that. You know, you got to be careful. There's a lot of forests that you have covered, as we mentioned earlier in the show, with the missing four one one type people and the national forest and everything. Do you have a set of forests that you're like, dude? I am never ever going in there. Um, probably the Akigahara forest in Japan. I- I'm very tempted to visit it, but at the same time, all the stories that I've read, uh, when I've done like Mount Fuji and uh, Akigahara stuff in the past, like it's just, I don't know, man. I don't, it just feels like there's too much energy there. I feel like it might be a little more dangerous than some of these other places. Is that, th- is that the suicide forest? Uh, yes, it is. That's the forest, if I recall. Logan Paul took a lot of heat on social media and on YouTube. He got actually banned from monetizing his YouTube channel because of that forest he shot a video in. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, definitely a very uh, controversial moment in his career, but he's definitely seemed to bounce back since then. 
Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Well, I think what happened there is while they were filming, there was actually a a, a gentleman who hung himself, and they accidentally got the, the gentleman on film. I think that's what happened there. Yeah, um, definitely. Definitely was unfortunate. It could have been avoided very easily, though. They could have just edited it out. Sure. Chad is wondering, Chad Smith, what kind of microphone do you use, Swamp Dweller, to make your story sound so awesome? Um, I use a Shure SM7B. Oh, we got the same microphone. Beautiful microphone. Nice and simple. Nice and simple. Just plug it in and go. You know? That's what you got to do, Chad Smith. Just get an SM7B. Just, just make the investment, man. Trust me. It's, it's worth every penny. Very true. Very true. Are there any topics you will not touch when it comes to Swamp Dweller Channel? Yeah, I try to avoid things that like touch on like children and like uh, like sexual assault stuff like that. I try to avoid those kind of things. Um, I know there's a bunch of other channels that will cover that kind of stuff, so if people want to see it, they can go there. But um, I try to avoid things that just uh, to me aren't necessarily scary more than it is just kind of like tragic. Um, unless it is spreading awareness for like unsolved cases or stuff or something like along those lines. But um, I try to avoid stuff like that just because I don't feel like anybody wants to hear that when they're trying to fall asleep. I feel like, you know, my channel is more of like a, a safe place, a, a solace kind of place to get away from politics and uh, get away from, you know, weird things like that that you're going to see on the news or just kind of see daily anyway in your social media timeline. We get a lot of veterans who listen to this show and participate in our chat room. Do you re receive a lot of uh, stories from veterans, from maybe weird sightings that they had while in different uh, maybe combat zones or, or hot zones in the world? Oh, yeah. I've actually I've had like five or six volumes of uh, military stories sent in from people from the military. I've done tons of first responder stuff as well from my cops, EMTs, stuff like that. And uh, there, a very notable one is one from Iraq where a soldier and his was sent in to go check out something. They thought it was going to be like a like a terrorist operation, something they were they thought they were uh, coming in on in it. Uh, turns out they ended up coming in on what they're called giants, like these really like giant people. They were like 15, 20 feet tall, he said. And uh, all, all he knew is like they were told to fall back. And then obviously they sent in like these uh, super armored tanks and whatever it was. It was kind of crazy. But apparently this was uh, in the mid 2000s. And uh, I don't remember all the details too. It's very vague. It's been a couple of years since I've read that one, but I've been sent quite a few interesting stories from the military, and I've got some probably coming again soon. I'd love to hear more of those. The, probably the creepiest story I ever heard from a battle zone was a gentleman named Jody Cook, who runs the North American Dogman Project. And he was on our show one night talking about these Anubis type of dogman creatures that have like all of this this armor on them and head plate and they wear use these these really uh like Arabic type of swords, you know, like the the, the ones that are kind of curled. And he after he appeared on our show a couple of years ago, he got a and it started off with an email, but it ended up being a very long phone call from a I, I believe an ex army ranger who was in Afghanistan and he was telling the, Jody the story and jo Jody related to me about how their platoon had split in two to try and meet up with another platoon that was taking a small arms fire. And they sent a couple of sentries up to kind of go look to see where the Taliban were. And they kind of come across this border on this mountain, uh, on this mountain side as they're coming around the mountain and they hear screaming. And so this one uh, soldier kind of hides behind a rock and and kind of pops his head up to just kind of take a look at what's going on. And here were these two eight-foot creatures literally slicing and dicing a bunch of Taliban members apart. Said it was the craziest thing. And then the one creature turned 
to sniff the air because it could smell the soldier. And he just stood very, very still. Very still in order to, you know, get the, uh, you know, hopefully the, the dog man or the Anubis would lose its scent. But yeah, I mean, that that one freaked me out, man. Totally freaked me out. Do you got anything like that? Um, Something similar, yeah. Um, Jody Cook's cool guy. I actually got to interview him when he first started the North American Dogman Project. Um, yeah, there's a lot of similar stories. Uh, that kind of reminds me of one. Um, it, was, it wasn't a dog, man. It, I can't, I don't even know what kind of creature this was, but it was, um, this was an army base somewhere, I believe in Europe. And there was this like woman that they, I guess, let me back up a bit. There were, they were basically like a nighttime guard. They were on the outskirts of the wall. They would basically, you know, go around and uh, make sure, you know, everything was good on the perimeter and they were making their rounds and they, they, see what looks like to be some woman hunched over a soldier who is knocked out or something unconscious. And as they're shining their lights on this woman and, and uh, shouting to her and, and, and approaching her, she like stands up and uh, they notice that this isn't really a woman. She's humanoid, looks like a female, has long hair, but her skin is like bluish green and it's like super cracked looking, almost like a, like a reptilian. And, um, this uh, lady jumps up into the sky and disappears into the darkness and uh, almost like Jeepers Creepers would. They didn't see any wings though. So they didn't, they, so they were completely shocked at how like she just jumped up and disappeared. They run up to the guy and they notice he's dead and his eyes are missing that it looked like it was being eaten out. And um, next thing they know, this woman is behind them by about 15 feet because they hear it land. And when they look, this thing like, has the two eyes of this man in its mouth spits him out towards them and starts screeching and running towards them they start shooting their guns at it like i'm not entirely sure what they had gun wise um but they start shooting their their weapons at it uh and this thing is not apparently being affected at all by these bullets it jumps over them and apparently disappears again into the darkness and they never see it again they uh they of course run back drag in the body and uh, apparently over the next few weeks, there were many like odd run-ins with a woman at night. And uh, I'm not entirely sure if that would be a cryptid, some sort of supernatural thing, or just some absolute, I don't even know what, what you would describe it as, some Jeepers Creepers type thing. But it, it's a very interesting story that stands out. No kidding, no kidding. You ever get any stories out of Vietnam with the with the rock apes? Um, I've been sent stories from Vietnam, but I, n- nothing with the rock apes, no. So Mainly just uh, like paranormal type stuff. Oh, could you share a story with us? Um, there was one from uh, a Filipino family that moved over to Vietnam because uh, apparently it was cheaper to live or something like that. And their, their dad got a good job or something over there. And uh, apparently this gin followed them from from the Philippines and was absolutely just terrorizing them, killing their chickens, killing their their uh, goats, uh, leaving scratches on their on everybody in the family, and just absolutely wreaking havoc. And uh, eventually, they had to bring in a priest to to bless the house and to battle it. And uh, even when the priest was trying to expel it with the uh, you know the I guess whatever practices they were doing in the religion they practice, um, he was getting scratched and there, there was like marks all over his clothing that you could see like claw marks and such. And uh, eventually they were able to expel it. But uh, it was just one of those crazy stories where it's just like how powerful like these things you can't even see can be. What bothers you more, the cryptid creatures or the gin or and ghost stories like that? To be honest, I would say the ones that creep me out more and give me more goosebumps are the the paranormal ones for sure. Just because like I've had so many run ins with what I believe to be the paranormal throughout my lifetime that I just instantly know how these people feel when they're like the, the goose when they mention that they get the goose flesh or the goosebumps, like I immediately know what they're talking about. Oh now you gotta go away from your channel for a second and share us a couple of uh true stories from Swamp Dweller himself. Oh man, um, I share these a lot on my live streams. I, people ask all the time. Um, they're not necessarily like super scary, but they are like they they are very, I guess, plenty. I, I used to 
not necessarily ghost hunt, but I used to love to explore like old and like historical places and I still do. So I've kind of like fallen into a lot of strange events in my life. Um, one that I like to share and one that I like to, to like think about sometimes is this old slave plantation in the middle of nowhere, East Tennessee. Um, I was out there with some friends one night because we across the street was this cemetery on the small little church that we were kind of exploring and checking out. And my friends ghost hunted. I didn't, I just kind of, like I said, tagged along to see these cool places. I didn't, when I was a young kid, I, I attempted to go some one time and had something follow me back and give me like cold sweats and terrible dreams. And that was enough for me to be like, yeah, I don't need to mess with that. Um, so I was just there to see what was happening We were walking through this like plantation field. It's dilapidated. It's really old. It hasn't been in use for a long time. You could still see some of the uh, like old, old rusted chain links and stuff where like the slaves would be tied to and they'd be picking the cotton and stuff. And uh, it's absolutely like tragic, but super cool to see this stuff like in person still being there. And uh, there was this old dilapidated house and right next to it. If you've ever seen the Jeepers Creepers truck in the movie, th- literally that truck was there. That's the exact truck rusted out. I was so shook. I was like, okay, I'm about to like die. Jeepers Creepers are living in this shit. But um, but I, I go up there. We, we go into the house eventually, and you know, like the floors are all falling through. The roof is falling through. Like most of the house is like just you probably should not have been walking in there. But we somehow made our way up to the second floor. And there was uh, just this very dilapidated little ladder hanging out to the top, uh, like, attic area where, like, the roof was basically falling in. But there was just enough room inside for us to sit up and kind of see the entire attic. And uh, so me and one of my friends go up there and sit there. And uh, our friends under there were talking. And we're just sitting there silent. And it sounds like a rock is thrown at us because it, like, lands near us. And we're like okay, that's weird. And we asked our friends if they're messing around, but there's no way they could throw a rock that angle and land near us. Um, so I'm like, okay, if that's not you, um, you go down. So I, I'm sitting there for my, by myself for a second and uh, another rock comes and lands near me. And so I throw that rock back and then it immediately comes back but with more force. And uh, um, my friend comes back up and then it happens again, but this time it hits him in the back. And as we're doing that, I look behind me and I see this like white face, like literally like an inch from mine. Um, and I just end up screaming and I jump down the ladder and we all just bolt out of there. But uh, that that's one of my little ghost stories there. Oh my goodness. My goodness. How did you react to when that was happening? Honestly, I really didn't know what was going on at first. I thought people were just messing around because we have a lot of funny kind of ghost stories as well. Um, with that friend group where we would just we went to like this haunted house and uh, there was a well and uh, apparently a little girl drowned in it. And for whatever reason, my friend took a poop in it. And um, he swears when he was doing that, he heard a little girl's voice coming up while he was doing it. And it was just like forever. It was like a funny story. Like you literally took a dump on a ghost. But um, like, I just remember just being absolutely shocked that there was a face that close to mine and I could see it in like full detail, but it was just white. So it, it just, it was like a flash though, just like for a split second, almost like, like, if you've ever been knocked out, like that flash of light that comes, like it was like that quick. It was just like, I didn't really know what to feel, what to think, but I was just more like, yeah, I've got to get out of here for sure. That fight or flight instantly kicked in. I want to change topics here because my buddy Merle called me up the other day, yesterday as a matter of fact, and he was telling me about this creepy dream he had about black-eyed children. And I'm wondering if you have any tales that you could share about black eyed children. Yeah. Black eyed children was like one of the first like paranormal phenomenon. I was like really interested in when I started this whole journey as swamp dweller. And I've been sent tons of stories over the years, but uh, one of my favorite ones is a lady who answers the door and these two children are asking for the phone and she refuses to give them the phone. And eventually, you know, after, many minutes of trying to coax her to come in um they they leave and she shuts the door and locks it but as she's watching them leave they walk up to this van and there are two older adults with black eyes in there and they get in and it drives away and then she notices that they go a couple houses down and try again 
And uh, it's a basic story, but it's just one of those things. It's like, what is that? Like, what are these things? There are there's adult versions and and children versions. Are they are they demons? Are they aliens? Are they are they humans? Like, what 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 are they? What do you think they are? I honestly have no idea. Um, I, I want to say I want to say they're demons, but at the same time. You know, I, I don't know too much more about them other than they apparently can bring death and disease on people if you interact and touch with them. So that sounds something like a demon would do, but at the same time, you know, it could be some sort of extraterrestrial thing. Who knows? No kidding. No kidding. I mean, these black eyed kids, like going uh, to what my buddy Merle was saying about what happened to him, is he said they were chasing him through the forest, you know, trying to get a hold of him. And, and chased him through buildings and everything. He didn't know what the heck was going on. I mean, I could just imagine the fear that somebody has on on something like that, man. Oh yeah, I would definitely be terrified if I were if I was face to face with something like that. Um, all I could do is just say, all I can really recommend to anybody is if you ever do encounter something like a black eyed kid, is just just don't look them in the eyes and try to. Uh, just try to exit the conversation as quickly as you can, because apparently if you look them in the eyes, they are, have a a tendency to be a lot more persuasive, apparently. so. Yeah, no kidding. I, not me, man. That's something that I do not want to check out. Have you ever had a story, so we got about three and a half minutes to go here before the top of the hour. Have you ever had a story about, uh, you know, that maybe has been a little controversial that you've been or received phone calls or been visited by government officials? Um, yes, I've always wanted to do like a men in black or, you know, type video like that, but I, I've never have just because it's, I just, I guess I've never really gotten around to it, but, uh, I've been sent a few stories, especially from park rangers where they had officials come to their house and tell them basically to, you know, quote unquote, you know, forget what you saw type stuff, you know? And, uh, um, there was one story from a park ranger where he saw what looked like to be like a bear type creature that was on both its hind legs and stuff like that. But instead of having like a bear head, it had more of like a werewolf looking head and had more of like dog looking legs. And, he, and uh, they call it a bear creature because of how fl fluffy and furry it was. But, you know, a lot of people think it might be some sort of dog man or something. But uh, after he saw this, it apparently it attacked somebody and killed them. Um, he was visited by a unnamed group of government officials who simply just showed them, you know, a badge and asked him very question, various questions about what this thing looked like, what it did, um, how he was feeling, if he was feeling suicidal, et cetera, stuff like that. Like a lot of very weird and uh, intrusive questions. And, uh, they left and basically when they were leaving, they looked back to him and said the classic, basically like, it would be best if you didn't talk about this with anybody else and et cetera, et cetera. How about for you? Have you had anybody contact you, uh, like from the government or police or anybody about some of the stories you put out there? I have actually had uh, investigators from a uh, murder unit in uh, Georgia reach out to me over a case because I was the only person that's ever actually made a video on it. That I'm still pretty sure to this day on YouTube that covered this case. And uh, they, I had a few theories in there that were helpful that helped them progress the case. And uh, that that's happened before. But I've never had like uh, the FBI or the CIA or any unnamed government official task force outside of, you know, like some police here and there. Uh, hit me up being like, you know, what 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 was this dog man story about or anything like that? That would take it to a whole new level, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, that would be definitely very interesting. See, for me, man, I could tell you right now, I have never, ever had any of those type of phone calls. I've wished for them. I wished that I could wake up in the middle of the night and see like black vehicles or blacked out vehicles sitting in front of SOR headquarters here never happens I don't get that type of luck man don't get it oh man <laughs> I wish I had the uh non-stop sightings like you would see on something like Monster Quest where like every day you go out and there's Bigfoot man that that when I first saw Monster Quest that's what I thought I was getting into when I started this whole thing but nope no no man bear pig yet no kidding I mean I I'm waiting I'm waiting. Now, I don't have Sasquatch around the headquarters here, 
I got to go a couple of miles into the bush from here. But I mean, I'm waiting, man. Uh, you know, I know, I know people, uh, Sasquatch hunters, who claim to have these these Sasquatch highways. Like every time they go there, they could they could pick up prints. And these are good, honest people who are who are talking about this, not the woo type. And I I can tell you, man, I'd love to run into one of those uh, Bigfoot highways. Really would. Swamp, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. We have Swamp Dweller, one of the greatest creepypasta contributors, influencers on YouTube. Make sure you go subscribe to his channel, Swamp Dweller. We're going to continue with the spooky stories when we return on Spaced Out Radio. And then at the bottom of the hour, we're warming up the Match Gate Ball. All right, bud, I'm just going to put you back in the green room for a second, and uh, I'm going to uh, just uh, go to the bathroom here. I'll be right back, okay? Awesome. I'm going to do the same. All right. Be right back, people.
All right. All right, we're back. All right. Hi, Lunar Tina. How are you? All right. Who else joined us? PBR, good to see you, buddy. And yes, my Magic 8 ball is white and green, PBR. I know you hate that, but you hate everything, so that's a good thing. We're right on track then. <clears throat> but he's a good veteran. He's hardened by these streets. Yeah, he's hardened by the Woo streets, man. Hardened by the Woo streets. Is there anywhere you want to uh, tap into <laughs> here before we uh, call it the night at the bottom of the hour? Anything we've missed? Um, nothing too much. Uh, can't think of anything too much. Uh, maybe I could touch on the new series that I've got going on, the Our Dark History series. We put out the pilot episode of that a couple weeks ago. Sure, we can touch on that. Absolutely. If history is anything people are interested in. We're always interested in history, buddy. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to Cable Guy Matt, Spooky, Todd, Fabster, and Smithy for the amazing Super Chats. It's a great way to support what we do here on a nightly basis on Spaced Out Radio, so thank you so much. Big thank you to all our new subscribers. We're 70 away from 14,000. That's a going to be a new milestone for us here and here we go everyone with hour three would you like to connect with us head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info now back to dave scott and sor here we go with the third and final hour of spaced out radio tonight my name is dave scott thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Nectari Voris. Nectari Voris is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot. Check out Shirky Poo's Newswire and check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. For the final time tonight, we're talking creepy pasta with one of the best on YouTube influencer and creepy pasta guru. Swamp Dweller is with us. He's a good friend of this show. He even tunes in every now and again when he's awake working away that late at night. And we're glad to have him here. Swamp Dweller, welcome back, my friend. Thanks for having me, Dave. It's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here again tonight, and uh, thank you so much for being a good friend of this show, man. We absolutely love you. Oh, and I love the show. It's it's a lot of fun to be here, and it's uh, great to see you guys doing your thing every single night. Well, somebody's got to keep you know. Otherwise, we all get bored. Let's just be honest. We all get bored if we're not here. But that's okay. That's okay. You got a new project that's uh, coming up here. Uh, yeah, um, it's a new undertaking. It's going to be on the same channel as everything else. And uh, we're calling it Our Dark History, where we uh, go super in-depth into uh, the darkest history of man, basically. Uh, we put out the pilot episode. It's 30 minutes long. It's uh, called War and Sacrifice, the Rise and Fall of the Aztec Empire. I'm sure most people know uh, the Aztec Empire is steeped in myth and folk folklore. It's probably one of the most fascinating cultures to ever dominate the Americas, from vicious warfare to ruthless religious sacrifice. It's truly a, a crazy and uh, insane story from start to finish. And uh, I'm going to give it to you 
exactly how it is. I'm not going to censor it. Like you'd probably, a lot of things that you learned in school probably weren't very accurate. And uh, once you watch these documentaries, they're, they're absolutely masterfully put together uh, with my, me and my friend Joey put a lot of work into the visual editing and everything. And uh, it's on par of with anything you'd see on like history channel or something like that. Right on. Why go into the dark history? Is it a subject that you feel just is not tackled enough? That and uh, personally, I'm just a history buff. I've always loved history. It was uh, my strongest subject as a kid growing up. And uh, honestly, I just always noticed uh, when I moved, I moved around a lot. So I went to a ton, to a ton, ton of different schools and every school would uh, have a different history book and it would have different variations of the same story. And uh, I always found that interesting and I, I found that weird. So I always went on independent research as a kid and growing up to look into things on my own. And what I've discovered is things are a lot more darker than they, they were made to be and or made out to be in school. And uh, I think it's just something that a lot of people would benefit from knowing the, uh, you know, the documented real truth. I would love for you to give a taste to our audience about some of the subjects you'll be covering. Um, so the first one was on the Aztecs. Uh, the next one will be coming out next week is on the five uh, crime families in New York City. So from uh, basically the early 1900s to about the 90s, you know, the five mafia families, they ran everything there. We're doing that. Then we're covering the uh, Sentinelese people over on uh, North Sentinel Island in India. Uh, we'll be covering MK Ultra. We'll be covering all kinds of stuff in that vein. Right on. Could you share a story about the Aztec video? Um, I, I would say my my uh, favorite part of it is uh, the the Aztecs were they were so brutal. The only way to actually like advance in their society would be to go out and collect um, sacrifices. So basically, they on every single day they would run out and find. Uh, um, neighboring villages that were not a part of their alliance and they would basically just go and kidnap their people and bring them over to their uh, military bases and hand them over to be sacrifices and that is how you would get military status and rank and subsequently move up in the social hierarchy of the aztecs so when it came time for hernan cortez and his troops to come over he was able to persuade a lot of those surrounding uh factions to join him and ultimately take over and, uh, you know, obviously the disease they brought as well wiped out about 90% of them. But uh, th that, I always found that incredibly gruesome and absolutely just chilling that the only way that you can make a name or make more money or even have any sort of uh, status at all is you would basically have to sacrifice people. Yeah, that, that's not a good one when you got to sacrifice people. Not a fan. No, of probably that. not. Not a fan of that. I, I'm definitely the kind of guy who would not volunteer for that. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, there, there, there's so much to go into. Like I said, it's very in depth. If if you're looking for something to watch and uh, kind of kill thirty minutes or fall asleep too, I really think uh, you guys will like this series. Definitely, I, I could totally see that. And is this something you're going to be putting out on a biweekly basis or monthly basis? I'm trying to do it on a bi-weekly basis but it's probably going to be closer to a monthly basis just because how you know visual it is and how much work goes into it and uh, how much uh, research and scripting and all that um so probably a monthly basis but it's going to definitely be a bit more frequent as we get the grind going and get used to everything because it's a bit of a different experience from what i normally do definitely i i can totally see uh, where you're going with that. You know, that why take on a project so huge? Um, honestly, it's just like the true crime stuff and the cryptid documentaries I do. It's just, it's a, it's a passion project and something that I'm very passionate about, something I really love. And I just think it has more value than the average content that I put out there. Not to say that the stories, they bring the entertainment value and they are cautionary tales in their own right. But these documentaries have historical value that'll live on past myself, you know, because God willing, uh, YouTube will be around long after I am. And hopefully, you know, these uh, pieces of documentation will be around for people to, you know, see the, the truth, you know, because who knows what history books are going to say in 10, 20 years. And who knows uh, how much it'll change because, you know, victory uh, th th those who win the war get to write the history, basically. So 
um, the story changes quite often, unfortunately. All right, let's get to a question from our audience here. This one comes from Thin Lizzy, who is asking, have you heard of the Aztec death whistle? Yes, I actually own one, and uh, the de- the death with the, the death whistle is actually exactly what inspired me to make this the the pilot episode. Okay, so can you explain what the death death whistle is for our audience? It's essentially a, a ceremonial whistle that they had to uh, signal mainly um, when they were going to uh, run out and get sacrifices that I mentioned earlier. And uh, sometimes they would use it to alert, you know, the, you know, armies and uh, guards and such when there were attacks coming and such. Oh, wow. Wow. It's a very scary sounding thing. If you if you've never heard it, you could probably look it up on YouTube. There's quite a few videos of people blowing on them. No kidding. No kidding. And how did you come across one? Um, there were there's a few on sale for on Etsy and stuff. And uh, I decided to grab one because it was uh from a uh, Native American family from uh, Mexico. And uh, I thought it would be cool to have an authentic piece like that. Sounds interesting. Very interesting. All right. We only got you for about 13 more minutes here on Space Out Radio. And it's it's flying on by. I, wa- I want to get back to some of your videos on your great channel, Swamp Dweller, on YouTube, which we highly recommend all of our listeners go and, and check on out. You know, do you ever get stories of people uh, having encounters with these red-eyed creatures, whether it's dogmen or, or versions of Bigfoot or whatever? Because these red-eyed creatures seem to be so much more freaky than any other creature out there. They always seem more ominous. Um, Yeah, I just feel like uh, the color red signals danger for a lot of people, especially in nature. When pe- when things are bright colored, especially red, normally it means they're poisonous and, you know, you shouldn't mess with them. And uh, it just, I think it signals fear and it triggers something that we we have kind of been trained and conditioned over the, you know, the generations to know that like demons and, and things that are evil and bad have the red eyes normally. So um, I think it's just this inherent ominous that comes from that natural foreboding feeling of those, you know, dark glowing red eyes in the, in the dark. Cause uh, whether it's just a bat or whether it is some sort of dog man, Bigfoot creature, it doesn't really matter what it is. You see those, tiny red eyes or those big red eyes you're you're kind of feeling a little bit freaked out usually does that include you receiving any stories about people having encounters with the hellhounds um i haven't been sent too many of those in recent memory but i have been sent some hellhound stories in the past there is one that i vaguely remember of a little girl being saved by a hellhound which i always thought was interesting I don't remember the details of it too much. It was probably three or four years ago that I shared it, but um, you don't really get stories that are kind of, I guess you say wholesome in a sense, but uh, so very ominous to see something that's like a black shadow with red eyes uh, physically like touching you, coming at you. And uh, for whatever reason in that story, it apparently decided to help her. Really? Very interesting one. I believe she was fall. It, it was something like she was like rock climbing or something, and she started falling. I guess, and uh, before she was able to fall completely over the side, this thing came and like grabbed her and like threw her over to the uh, ground so she didn't fall over. I don't know how I would react if that happened to one of my kids, man. I I, I don't even know how i would react uh, if that was me or if that was my child or just my friend or anything like it's just like an experience like how do you explain like you're about to fall to your death and then suddenly like something that you can't see anymore or really feel or explain to somebody is like literally like saving you no kidding no kidding you talk a lot about the darkness of everything because your channel is to to you know allow people to feed off of their 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 spooky and and creepy stories and 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 uh you know the, the people like me we want to hear those stories and have those goosebumps happen but do you ever get stories that are sent to you regarding 
anything of the light, you know, whether it's angels, whether it's encounters with with beings that that save people, you know, out of very dark situations. Yeah, I've been sent quite a few stories of these beings that are like made of light almost, and uh, I've been sent uh, what people call like angels or you know uh, guardian angels or spirit guardians and and such like that. Um, not all of them are creepy. Some of them are kind of wholesome and more like, I guess, ominous and strange more than outright horrific. But I have been sent a lot of interesting stories like that, especially this weird phenomenon recently. Like I just mentioned, these these people, these beings that are just made of pure light. And uh, I just read a story earlier today in a, in a video that will be coming out soon in the State series um, of these people that were hiking with their dog. And they see this interesting, almost like teardrop-shaped, kind of glowing white, very bright being just floating there kind of staring at them trying to play hide and seek almost behind these trees with them and it disappeared after a few minutes and when they ran up to the area to see if there's any trash or any debris that might have been you know playing with their eyesight in the sun or something there was nothing there so it was definitely something similar to what we were just talking about with these like bright beings these light beings there seems to be like a an uptick in these type of encounters do you follow the trends? Um, here and there. Um, I will definitely notice, you know, over the year, like different times, like certain and certain type of creatures or certain type of beings or certain type of stories will be sent in more often. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, if that is trends or if that's just, you know, maybe what's the coincidence was for that month or whatnot. But, um, there definitely do seem to be trends and I will sometimes follow them, but, uh, I try to just kind of, I try not to trend hop. I try to more just kind of cover what people actually want to see more than what, you know, is being popular at the moment. The reason why I ask that is, you know, like, do your stories go in trends? Like, all of a sudden, one month you're going to get a bunch of tales about Bigfoot. The next month it's going to be about Dogman. Or the next month it's about, you know, stories from from forest rangers or something along those lines and i'm just wondering if if you've noticed any trends like that because i love patterns man um from time to time yeah um i i would say the the cryptid stories have always kind of been incredibly diverse i feel like that's been a trend it's never been like just bigfoot or just dogman it's always been a mix of whatever you could imagine uh any amalgamation of, of diverse looks or uh, encounters you can imagine in the cryptid world it's always been very diverse month to month um i've always seen a plethora every single month more and more it seems of just more paranormal encounters and uh, such like that but it, there there are definitely trends like sometimes there will be like sometimes it seems like i'll get sent like six stories in a day from military people and it's all from completely different people and the stories are like almost similar it's kind of creepy sometimes you're like oh wow like these crazy like trends are these crazy like coincidence kind of happen and you're just like this is very cool to see but also kind of kind of eerie sometimes when it happens you're like oh man that was strange does anything catch you off guard anymore um not really i i i would say the things that probably catch me off guard the most is just like the things people say sometimes in stories because like sometimes it just makes no sense or sometimes it's just like uh the way people describe some of these creatures are it's just like so jumbled where it's just like I'll read it and I'll just be like, What? What did I just read? Like I'll have to read it back a few times to really even understand myself what what, what they're trying to describe, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. So being that nothing really catches you off guard anymore and and that you're you're really trying hard, you know, with all your hard work, I mean do you think that it, it's the stories that don't phase you anymore? Or do you think it's it's the fact that you're so concentrated on getting the story out that you don't really have time to think about it? I think it's more of just um, when you have done this for five years and have probably put out more than a thousand videos uh, over the time, and have done multiple projects, you know, just like reading stories in general, you just kind of get used to it. And like the nothing really surprises you anymore. 
And um, that's why when you do get a story that like when you're done reading, you're like, wow, that was a really good story or like, wow, that really got me into it or like, wow, that was fun. I'd like to do that again. It's very memorable. And normally those are the stories that get their own video, you know, they'll have their own title and everything. And uh, yeah, I, I guess it's just more of just, you know, when you do something so much, it's like working out, you know, you have to eventually get ha- uh, higher and higher in weight, you know? So uh, it's just, I feel like it's just, you know, dealing with so many of them. I eventually have just kind of gotten a little bit desensitized to the details of the stories and uh, I guess to your point, I am more focused on the performance and making sure I'm I'm reading and uh, expressing and emoting uh, what's what's being conveyed. Do you regret that? No, because I I think that's what makes the swamp so great. And it just keeps growing, man. It just keeps growing. Definitely. We have about four minutes left with you tonight. And what I would love for you to do, if you don't mind, is tell us a story. Tell us a story. What What is Swamp Dweller's favorite story out of the thousand or so videos you have completed over the years? Um, hmm. That's a interesting question. And I'm not entirely sure how to answer that one. Um... Can you can you re-ask the question? You've done over a thousand videos. You know, I mean, from any topic. Is there is there a story that stands out for you the most that you would consider one of your favorites? Um I would say I would probably have to say a recent one that I did stood out more than probably most others. And it was called a stay out of Yosemite national park. And and, and it's simply just the, the descriptive nature of how the author was able to describe how they felt, you know, how the dissension into madness to dissension into, you know, feeling more and more hopeless and feeling like you're not going to escape with your life and kind of just conceding to the fact that, you're going to die here. And this creature, this, this thing that is hunting you down is, is going to win and it's going to make you its dinner. And, uh, I just feel like there's not a lot of stories that like that I've done over the years that have really done that perfectly to a T like that story did without any subtle details that like a single commenter would be like, would comment and be like, Oh, that, that, that ruined the story. It was just like, it seemed across the board, five out of five, uh, and everybody seemed to agree. How about creatures? What, what's your favorite creature to talk about outside outside of the the not deers? I would have to say probably like the bunyip or the amelatuka. Um, I just love the bunyip from Australian Aboriginal lore. It's just got so many various descriptions and uh, so many different stories, and I just. I love the history behind it. And uh, there is like a lot of cool, like physical evidence early in the 1800s that was collected about it and stuff. And the Melatuka is just like, like a living dinosaur over in the Congo. And like, it would be so cool if like a triceratops type creature actually still existed. Oh, I know. I know. I, I still wonder about these dinosaurs. I mean, even down in Texas and Mexico where there's uh, allegedly these mini Tyrannosaurus rexes and mini raptors running around. Oh man. Um, I've not been sent many stories on anything like that. There was one story. I think it was from like Utah or something. I got sent of like, like mini T-Rexes or something, but oh man, I would, I I've not ever looked much into those, uh, dinosaur type cryptids much outside of the Amelatuka and the, uh, uh, Mokela Membe. Those are crazy. Crazy. Do me a favor, my friend, as we got about 40 seconds left. Tell everybody where they can find your stories. Um, you can find me on YouTube. Just search Swamp Dweller. I'll pop right up. If you listen to scary stories on podcast providers, I'm on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast. Just type in Swamp Dweller or The Dark Swamp and I'll pop right up. 
Um, I upload videos just about every other day and usually um, on a daily basis throughout these holiday seasons to keep you guys extra entertained as you guys are probably being terrorized by extra family who is coming to visit. And uh, you can find me pretty much anywhere. You know, I'm on the Chilling app as well. If you're looking for a cool, scary story app that has ambient sounds and all kinds of cool stuff with uh, vintage horror radio, vintage horror novels, and exclusive horror stories, the Chilling is the place to do so. But, uh, yeah. My friend, Swamp Dweller, it's always a pleasure to have you on this show. It's a real honor to call you a friend and supporter of Space Down Radio. Thank you very much. Coming up next... We have the Magic 8 Ball. Starting to warm it up now. Get your questions ready in capital letters when we come back on Spaced Out Radio. All right, buddy. That was fantastic. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, man. It was great. Oh, dude. You know, anytime you want to come on, you know you got a place, man. You know you got a place. Oh, yeah, definitely. We'll have to circle back and do something after the new year. Exactly. And, uh... Yeah, whatever you need from us, man, just just let my team know or let me know, and my team is always more than willing to help you out with whatever you need, bro. Oh, yeah, definitely. And uh, I appreciate you having me on again. It's always lovely to be able to interact with you guys and the Spaced Out Radio fans, and uh, definitely have to come back soon. Not a problem, buddy. We'll we'll make it happen, and I know we'll see you in the chat room, you know, sometime in the evenings as well. So thanks, buddy. Really appreciate you, and happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. You too, brother. I'll see you soon. All right. Take care. Swamp Dweller, everybody. How awesome is he? How awesome is he? Original Jensen, welcome to our Spaced Out Radio channel. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Wow, man. We've gained like 50 subscribers since yesterday. All because of Swamp Dweller. That's awesome. Love him. Such a nice dude, man. Such a nice, nice dude. Now i got to figure out what I'm going to listen to tonight. I think I'm going to listen tonight to his biggest video that he has, which is Park Ranger Horror Stories. It's an hour and 17 minutes long. Yeah, I'm definitely listening to that one tonight. Paisley Town is an amazing show. Love Paisley. Going to listen to frog people. Yeah, we need to get somebody on talking about Ohio cryptids. There's a lot of weird stuff going on there. Hey, Tits McGee, thank you. More to come, Dave. Nothing better than word of mouth when those 50 people tell someone else about your channel. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Well, that's why we do this seven nights a week. I'm here Monday through Friday, and Lynn Waldington is here uh, Saturday and Sunday. And soon, in just like three and a half weeks, we are going to be adding more to the weekend as Lynn Wallington is going to be going from 6 p.m. Pacific to 8 p.m. Pacific. And then from 8 p.m. until 11 p.m., we are going to have our good friend Big Willie, Gemma Jade, and John Hudson coming in for what we call after hours. Hey, Swampy, thank you so much for that super chat, man. You didn't have to do that. You're more than gracious enough coming on this show, brother. Thank you. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Yep. 
I'd give Swamp Dweller a show on our channel for sure. For sure. But Thin Lizzy, considering you're part of our booking team, uh, and I don't see any other of our bookers here, uh, let's try and find in for January a a cryptid investigator in Ohio who can talk about everything from Dogman to to Bigfoot to the Frogman of Loveland. That'd be great. We haven't done a Frogman show in a long time. Ozark Monsters, that's a good topic too. <coughs> if you guys have any questions that you want uh, to see about topics or guests, I'll put in uh, Thin Lizzy's email here, brie at spacedoutradio.com. And all you got to do is email her and or Dirty Filth or, or uh, Sparkles or Jennifer and or Spookles and Jennifer and they will be uh, able to uh, track someone down for you. Here we go, everyone. Let's have a good one here. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Let's get to the Magic 8 Ball. We're going to go a little psychic here for all of you. Magic 8 Ball's all warmed up for you all. you got to be in our YouTube chat in order to get some questions in. So let's start right off the bat with Spooky, who is asking, Does Dave know what we're most thankful for this holiday season on Spaced Out Radio? Well, of course I do, without even ringing this. It is Black Friday. America, this is your time to shine once again. Last year, due to COVID, it was a bust a complete bust, but this year we can do it right and we can do it bigger and better than what we've ever done Black Friday before. Tape up those knuckles, put on the football gear, and for those in the Central or East Coast, you can put on your hockey gear, all right? Let's go bust some chops, high stick some people, trip some kids trying to get to the toy section, push over the elderly, Let's punch, let's pinch, let's scrape, let's bite, let's yank hair. And remember, people, do us a favor. Turn your cameras horizontal. It's a better video for us who need this fix. But nonetheless, do not disappoint this year on Black Friday. The malls are open, people. All the big stores are going to be open. Everything's going to be discounted. Go for it. Let's make this happen. All right, Spooky, what are we thankful for? Does Dave know? My sources say no, he doesn't. It's because I'm Canadian, and my Thanksgiving was last month. So I don't know. That's a correct answer. All right, Thin Lizzy is asking, will the frozen dead guy in Nederland, Colorado, wake up? Oh, that's a good question. Will frozen guy wake up? Signs point to yes. I wonder if you'll have the zombie thing going on. I wonder. We'll have to find out. 
Gorgeous Gene Beckett, there's a frogman? Well, let's find out from the Magic 8-Ball. Not today, Sheriff. Not today. Magic 8-Ball doesn't believe in the frogman. Even though the first sighting came from two police officers on patrol. Amazing. All right. Oh, on Twitch watching us right now. Umberto Caldera. Hugs from Mexico. Tell me if Magic 8-Ball thinks there's chupacabras in the region. Well, I know they, we don't have chupacabras up here because they don't have a lot of fur. And it's awfully cold up here, man. And it's only going to get colder. So let's find out here. Magic 8-Ball. Chupacabras for Umberto. Intel looks good. You have the chupacabras down there in your region, buddy. You got the chupacabras there. So that's awesome. Thank you for listening in Mexico. We really appreciate it. I love it when we get people from all around the world, man. It just, it it blows me away each and every time. Like Humberto here's in Mexico. Chris Mo in our chat rooms from Austria. We got Grandpa Holland in Australia along with with Ange and a number of others. We had the Mad Kiwi here from, from New Zealand. You know, we, we get Iberata from Singapore. We get all our listeners in from the United Kingdom who are waking up early and waking up to us as our their morning show. Man, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. All right, let's go to Joe. Magic 8-Ball, does Dave have to change his undies after listening to Swamp Dweller stories? Well, let's see here. That one. Intel looks good, Joe. Intel looks good. Yeah, sometimes. Not going to lie. Sandra, will Dave get his Black Friday wish of high-quality videos of brawling and looting and an absolute thuggery on Black Friday? Oh, come on, Magic 8-Ball. Come on, I need this. Don't count on it. Sometimes Magic 8-Ball is painful in its predictions. That hurt. That hurt. Let's try again. Let's rephrase the question from Jules. Will there be a plethora of Black Friday carnage for Dave this year? Signs point to yes. We're back in the game. Back in the game. Let's do this, America. We can do this. Uh, Duke from World Bigfoot Radio, another channel you should subscribe to on YouTube, says, thank you, Dave. I complained to my guests about that damn letterbox view as well. Turn your ca- your phones horizontal. We need the quality video. If you're brawling this, uh, on Friday, if you're going to be brawling, We need the high-quality video, people. All right. DJ is wondering, is Chad Smith, that's spelt Snith, good Bigfoot bait? That's a good question. Let's find out, because if he is, I'm bringing him up here. Oh, no. Magic 8-Ball says, my sources say no. Painful. Painful. All right, World Bigfoot Radio, Super Duke. Will Dave have Duke on his show again before Duke has Dave back on his show? Yes and beyond. In fact, Duke, we're going to change that right now. Let's go back onto the calendar here. Let's go into the month of December. And December 23rd, my friend. December 23rd. Let's get Duke... And Duke, we're going to do a Bigfoot panel. So we'll call it Duke and Friends Bigfoot Panel. Bigfoot Year in Review. Sound good? I just want Nate Rudd there. Nate Rudd has to be there out of Spokane, Washington. And we can make that happen. You're already booked in. So put that on your calendar, December 23rd, Duke, our Bigfoot Year in Review. So, yes, I got you booked. 
How about that? That was quick. All right. Sandra wants to know, well, she lives on Vancouver Island here in British Columbia, beautiful area. She wants to know, will she ever see Sasquatch on Vancouver Island? Ask again later. The reason why it's saying that, Sandra, is because it's not the season for you. And I do not believe you live near Cowichan Lake. You need to go to Cowichan Lake and, and, and there's Bigfoots around there. There's Sasquatch around there. You know that. You got to go hang out there a little bit more. All right. A lovely question from awesome Ann Palmer. Will I meet the man of my life? Let's see. Let's help Ann out here, Magic 8 Ball. Let's see here. Come on. It's, It's like right on the edge. My sources say yes, according to the Magic 8 Ball. Sources say yes. Keep on plugging, Ann. Keep on plugging. Worst case scenario, Ann, Fap in our chat room is single. If you can get him away from bingo, he is single. All right, let's go to Ms. McGee. Is the devil's hole in Nevada protecting what they say it is? Levels are positive. That whatever they say it is, is protecting the devil's hole. I don't even know what that is. I don't even know what that is. All right. Next question. Is it true from Brazelhoff? I always take his questions with a grain of salt because he plays guitars with a reverse headstock on them. Ugly as sin. Ugly. I don't even like it when Kurt Hammett from Metallica plays that. On his ESP. Or Jackson's with the reverse headstock. Looks wrong. Now what really looks wrong on a guitar is a reverse headstock Fender Stratocaster. Terrible look. Terrible. Anyways. All right. Is it true that swamps always level out to a flat surface? Magic 8 ball. Sensors read no. Sensors read no. Sorry about that. All right. Let's continue on here with our guests here. All right. Let's go to Chad Smith. Will DJ get any work done tonight, or is he just going to play on SOR? Levels are positive that DJ will get some work done while listening to Spaced Out Radio. The man is multi-talented and multifaceted. That works for me. Sensational Sherry. Will Dave trim up his beard so we can see his slimmer face since the weight loss? I gained a couple of pounds after the Taco Bell weekend. I'm not going to lie. I'm feeling shame. But I have no regrets. No regrets. Sensors read no. Not trimming my beard. My beard is here until... Um, April? April? Yep. Got to keep warm through the Canadian winter. It gets cold up here. And I never really knew until last, believe it or not, last year was the first time I had a big beard. And I never really knew how warm it actually keeps my face. The hair freezes, but you don't really feel it. I got to feel like a deer or a moose out there. You know? Feels good. Smells good, too, because I got the Mighty Moose beard oil in there. All right. Jules, will Dave ever get a proper Magic 8 ball? What's wrong with the this one? So for you in Radio Land who are not seeing this, I have a Buzz Lightyear Magic 8 ball because I'm a huge Toy Story fan. And I wish Andy in Part 3 would not have thrown away his toys. That broke my heart. Broke my heart. But nonetheless, nothing wrong with my 8 ball. What does it say? Don't count on it, Jules. Don't count on it. You just upset the Magic 8-Ball. 
All right. Elaine in the UK is asking, and good morning to you, Elaine. Will I see a UFO before the year is done? Or will Elaine see a UFO before the year is done? Signs point to yes. Look up. You'll see something. You will. All right. Humberto in Mexico. Will the gremlins destroy my electronics again this Christmas? You got gremlins? Did you get photographs of those? Don't count on it. It's going to be a peaceful Christmas for you, Humberto. Yep. If not, just borrow one of Joe's pointy sticks from California. He'll help you take that. Andy. Magic 8-Ball, do I have to run faster than Bigfoot or just faster than my Bigfoot buddy? Reply hazy, try again. Hold on, let me rephrase that. All right. Will Andy trip his Bigfoot buddy in case they come into play with an aggressive Bigfoot? Out of fuel, try later. Doesn't like that. He said, no. Just run, Andy. Run as fast as you can. Mm, Let's see here. More questions here from our audience. And where, where are we here? Jules. Will Anjali get arrested breaking into the mountain? This will be our final question for the night. The answer is all clear. She is not going, so she has no interest in getting arrested. Well, it's not that she has an interest. She has no ability to be arrested. Probably more like it. No ability. She ain't going, Jules. She ain't going. Let's get to Shirky Poo's news. And this is how it ends. Jerky Boo's got us all set up for the news tonight. Starting off at the Pentagon, where in Washington, they are stepping up efforts to probe possible alien activity after officials admitted they could not explain the phenomena of UFO sightings. The Department of Defense is rolling out a new group tasked with finding and identifying UFOs in restricted airspace, officials said on Tuesday. The new outfit comes in after the intelligence community verified a series of unexplained aerial phenomena sightings by the military earlier this year, but said it could not identify the mysterious vehicles in a report to Congress detailing the government's knowledge of UFOs. The Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group will succeed the Navy's Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force. An arm of the military started last year to improve its understanding of and gain insight into UFOs. Incursions by any airborne object into our SUA pose safety of flight and operation security concerns and many pose national security challenges, the department wrote. The DOD takes reports of incursions by any airborne object identified or unidentified very seriously and investigates each one. Earlier this year, officials confirmed that they had investigated 144 UFO sightings reported by government sources since 2004, including unexplained vehicles that traveled at speeds up to 43,000 miles per hour and changed direction on a dime. Most incidents, such as the near-daily sightings of UFOs harassing a warship near San Diego in 2017, were not part of the U.S. programs that it meant to keep under wraps, according to the task force confession or congressional report. While the report offered little extraterrestrial insight, it did recommend that the government improve the policies, training, and technology needed to further investigate and understand unexplained aerial phenomena. It's like this is something new. When I read stories like that, I get mad. I really do. They're acting like this is new. It's not new. In America, it's 70 plus years old. Gotta love the media. Wildlife officials in Tennessee said an officer responded to an elementary school break-in 
where a deer forced its way into a classroom through an emergency exit. The Tennessee Wildlife Recovery Resources Agency officer Caleb Stratton responded to Westside Elementary in Springfield on the report of a deer inside the building. And the deer had apparently forced its way into the school through an emergency exit. The white-tailed buck, nice rack by the way, uh, is in good spirits and was allowed to go free. And he even did not have to graduate. Sad news here. Police in Tennessee said several gallons of Jack Daniels whiskey spilled onto a highway on-ramp when a truck carrying $400,000 worth of the beverages overturned. Yeah, police say the semi-truck was turning onto an Interstate 24 when it tipped over, causing some of the bottles inside to break and leak their contents onto the roadway. We saw many crying men lying on the road at that point, the police said. The department shared photos of the liquor streaming down and many tongues on the side of the concrete. It was unclear how much of the whiskey survived the crash, but around 400 grand, Jack Daniels, I'm sure they are insured for that. That shipment, by the way, was going to Israel. And uh, let's see here. Do we have time for one more? Of course we do. It's Florida man. Pinellas Park Police arrested a St. Petersburg man after they said he allegedly battered the manager after getting mad over a sushi mishap. Yeah, Paul Mitchell, not the stylist, entered the Hibachi Buffet restaurant, became angry after seeing that they were not serving the sushi he requested. He then allegedly started flipping over plates of fresh sushi in the buffet line, causing about $250 worth of property damage. All over sushi, he's now heading to court. Let's get to the thought of the day, which is, what's your weirdest Thanksgiving story? Gary, after turkey dinner one year, my dad put the turkey bones and remains out in a pan on the patio to cool off. Checked on it a bit later, and the whole turkey and pan were gone. Never found out where it went, but somebody must have enjoyed it. Gail, not weird, just adorable. Received a phone call from my daughter as a newlywed cooking her first Thanksgiving dinner. She was so baffled and wanted to know what to do with the turkey lungs. Turned out she was talking about the gizzards. Jim, little girl, do you pray before you eat? Other little girl, no, my mom's a good cook. That's a good one. Ted, a bit late, Dave. Thanksgiving is in October. Yes, it is for us, Ted. Yes, it is. Lynn, we're supposed to have a fully cooked turkey dinner from a store. Nope, found it was uncooked turkey raw. Everyone else's was cooked. We don't make a ritual of eating it, eating whatever we have now. And that's where we'll keep the thought of the day. Thank you so much for everyone participating. Thank you to Shirky Poo for the news. And, of course, to Swamp Dweller for freaking us out tonight. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Space Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your story with us, because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night.